So good morning and welcome everyone to School Psychology as a Comprehensive Service Delivery Model Series uh, here on Pat and Zoom this morning. So this session is research to practice expanding the role of school psychologists to provide a continuum of services. We are so excited that you can join us and we are so grateful to our um, district teams who are presenting this morning. These are three excellent examples of school psychologists and admin teams who have worked together to start to expand that role of the school psychologist to be able to provide more comprehensive um, model of service delivery. So our agenda this morning, we will start with Indiana Area School District out to the west. Then we'll hear from State College Area School District. We do have a short break allocated in this morning's schedule. Then we will um, hear from Derry Township School District further to the east. And then finally, you'll have an opportunity um, to just kind of open up to the whole panel some Q&A, uh, practical tips on how to help school psychologists really deliver comprehensive service services to benefit every student. Just a few quick announcements. In order to receive credit, you do need to stay for the entire session. At the end, we will share a code um, to enter into a survey. So if you need credit, please stay for the duration of the session. We will be monitoring the chat. I'm Erica Caruder, joined by several of my patent school psychology colleagues. Um, we've got Dr. Drew Hunter, Dr. Kate Parker, Dr. Gina Spicknall-Cook, and Mr. Scott Simo will be helping to manage the chat this morning. So I think what we'll do is after each question, after each school presents, we're gonna take a few questions from the chat and then you can also save those for the very end after you've heard everyone's session and uh, have just some good conversation about how to put the research into practice and how to put the ESPS model into practice. We are recording this session. Also live transcription is enabled. If you just click the little CC at the bottom of your screen, you can um, enable the live transcription if you choose to do so. So I think those are all of our announcements. We're just very, very excited and very grateful for all of our teams for um, taking the time to share their journeys with our school teams participating in the series this year, as well as others who were interested in learning more. So I'm going to go ahead and stop share, and I'm going to turn it over to our first presenters from Indiana Area School District. Welcome, Indiana. Thanks, Erica. Hi, my name is uh, Justin Zahorchak, and I'm a director of special education at Indiana Area School District. Uh, today, uh, myself and my team are going to talk to you about our school district's transformation over the last three years uh, and the process that we use to provide services. Uh, the purpose of our time today is really going to, we're going to talk about four big things. Uh, one being, um, you know, what we've done uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, talk about some of the successes that we've had, some of the challenges that we've had, and then also get a chance to hear from, directly from our school psychologists on um, how they specifically work within our system. Uh, I, I would almost preface uh, this conversation with, you know, by, by no means are we perfect, uh, by, we have lots and lots of work yet to do, uh, many, many areas yet to grow. Um, so uh, a little bit about us, April, if you wanna go ahead to the next slide. Um, my, again, my name is Justin Zahorchak. I'm a director of special education. With me today, I have Angela McMasters, uh, April Morelli and Shelly Wright, who are all MTSS facilitators and school psychologists with, within our district. Uh, and in my own opinion, um, and I think our school psychologists would agree, uh, the, the best part of what we've done over the last three years is build an amazing team. And uh, that's, I, I really can't stress enough how important a great team is. And um, what we've developed at Indiana, I think is special uh, because of the people that are on it. Um, so um, all of us, uh, myself and our school psychologists are all within, uh, we've, we've been at the district for less than three years and, and we've done a lot of work getting to this point. Um, Shelly, Ange and April, we're gonna share uh, again, some specifics as to what they do within our system. Uh, but I'll start with the process on what we've done to kind of get started and to build the system that we work in. 
Um, so a little bit of background on our school district. Um, when I began in my role in 2019, one of the first items that we attempted to tackle was uh, the existing test in place model that was that was in place. And really what we found was that it wasn't anybody's fault. There was, you know, it was the fault of nobody's but the system itself. The system was created um, to allow or to, to almost make it impossible for school psychologists to do anything else but test in place. And uh, at that time, we had um, 1.75 school psychologists that were hired through our local intermediate unit. And one of the school psychologists was with us full time. And we had two others that filled that role of 0.75. So there was one um, school psychologist that was with us one day a week. Uh, and the other was with us, I think, two days a week. And uh, what we found with that was that, you know, the people that were there part time, um, their level of investment, it was really hard for their level of, of investment into the community and into, you know, into our school district. So um, we wanted to change that. We wanted to change uh, into more of a comprehensive approach. Uh, and we've, we've been able to do that. So one of the fir very first things that we did was, you know, we uh, built some support and buy in from our school board, um, spoke, spoke with the, our local intermediate unit. Um, spoke with our district solicitor, talked with uh, our union uh, leadership, and um, we were able to, within about a six-month span, um, uh, move from utilizing the, uh, the school psychologist at the intermediate unit to hiring three of our own, uh, and we uh, selected some really great people with Ann, Shelley, and April. Um, but what we did, um, you know, that changed, again, took about six months. And um, again, countless amount of time, uh, you know, just as, as far as, you know, building buy-in from, from those that are around us. And I think that was, that was really our key, uh, was building that support from, you know, from, you know, our school board. Um, but then uh, in the 2020-21 school year, April, if you want to go to the next slide, what we did was we worked with Indiana University of Pennsylvania to develop a partnership with them. Uh, to provide three school psychology interns and two graduate assistants. Um, so our team is a, a pretty robust team uh, now in comparison to, you know, two years ago or three years ago, where we had, you know, 1.75 school psychologists. The majority of what we were doing was test in place. Again, the fault of nobody's. Um, so we've been able to build that to have three of our own school psychologists, um, uh, three grad or two grad assistants and uh, three school psychology interns. And we've seen some, uh, some amazing benefits from that. And I think the biggest things that, that, that we've been able to benefit from are, you know, we've moved from that test in place model to a comprehensive model. Um, we've, we've also been able to select our own school psychologists and we've selected um, some really great ones. As far as challenges uh, that we've faced in, in, like throughout our process, um, with all of us being new, relatively new, all within, you know, three years of, of being in the school district, um, we've also implemented a lot of new changes. And, um, you know, with, with change, change is not always easy. And so some of the changes that we've initiated, um, we've moved towards the science of literacy. We've started implementing social and emotional learning programs. We started uh, school-wide positive behavior support in the buildings all within three years. And so that is a massive amount of change. So I think our biggest challenge was building that buy-in and building trust with, you know, with, you know, starting with our school board, but we also had to build trust with um, the principals. We had to build trust with our teaching staff. And I think that's going, you know, it, the, the first year was uh, no doubt there were many, many challenges and there were many questions on, you know, the, the practices that we were attempting to utilize. But I think through time, I think we have been able to change the mindset a little bit uh, and build a common language throughout the district. Um, so as opposed to that simple test in place model, we've We've worked to build systems to support students. We've, we have, a, we have a, a few big focuses that we work on, um, just a few of them. We're working on building systems that are focused on data-based decision-making, and we're utilizing data across all settings, data uh, in the area of academics and in behaviors. Um, we've been focused in a lot on communication, how we collaborate uh, and how we consult with uh, our teaching staff, our parents, 
we've been focused on building those support systems. And as you can see here, this is an example of what we do um, for our academic and our social emotional supports. Uh, and then lastly, we've been focused in on providing evidence-based interventions uh, to support our students. And the number one thing that I think uh, that we've been working on, on one, number one initiative in our district over the past few years really has been building those support systems for students. Um, our school psychologists not only work uh, in the system, but they help build this system. And um, just looking at the left and the right side, if you on the left side, you'll see our academic supports. And on the right side, you'll see the social emotional supports or behavioral supports that we were offering to students. And a lot of changes over the last three years. And, um, you know, they're really paying off now. Uh, again, it was really tough work early on. Uh, but academically, we've been building systems. Uh, we've moved towards the science of literacy. Uh, and we're using a, a, a new program called CKLA uh, at our elementary school levels as our core tier one programs. Uh, and then we've also been adding uh, district and building data teams uh, and then adding win times to uh, help support those students academically. Behaviorally, um, we've introduced PBIS um, and we're in a pretty, pretty great spot with that right now. We've also introduced social emotional learning program. We use PATHS, um, which stands for Promoting Alternative Thinking Strategies at, at our elementary buildings. Um, we've also introduced utilizing a screener, uh, the screener that we use uh, uh, for uh, internalized and externalized behaviors is uh, the SRSS, uh, which is the student risk screening scale. And um, in addition to that, we've added a good bit of uh, evidence-based interventions. Um, some examples are, um, you know, we've, we utilize check-in, check-out. We utilize some different small groups programs like skill streaming for, for students that um, uh, need some additional assistance with social skills. And um, so we've also added, um, you know, quite a few uh, evidence-based interventions and uh, our school psychologist is gonna talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but at this time, I'm gonna pass the conversation over to our school psychologist and they're gonna go into some detail on, uh, on specifically what they do within our system. Uh, Ange? All right, good morning, everyone. Um, so we're going to talk with you a little bit about how we've been able to shift from surviving to thriving and, as Justin said, the three of us were all new to the district. I started with Justin in 2019 solely as an MTSS facilitator. And so my role as a school psychologist was a little bit on hold um, as far as some of the traditional work, but I really had a focus in MTSS, which was for the first time in my career, I felt like I was able to thrive. And I went from the hamster wheel, which, um, I loved my previous district, but to actually have a chance where I felt like I could make such a substantial difference for our students was the most rewarding part of the work. And I don't wanna speak for the rest of our team, but I feel like that was the most liberating. And as we talked about how to present and we looked at NAST's comprehensive model, it was like so evident that we always knew our domains of practice really, really well, but we never had them embedded within the organizational structure that we needed to be fully comprehensive. And so we do have work to do and we're definitely still new in this whole journey, but I would definitely say that by having that organizational structure, we've finally been able to practice in all of the domains um, that are so relevant to our practice as school psychologists. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it along to my teammate. Thanks, Ange. So as Ange was talking about, we definitely have, um, you know, experiences through our training and through our previous employers and work um, with practice in each of the domains. So um, as Ange said, those, those pieces and parts are kind of no-brainers for us. Walking into an organization, though, that has the vision and mission for change um, has just been a change, huge change for all of us um, and a good positive change. So in um, Indiana Area School District, the vision and mission to change brought forth um, by our admin team um, was the vision that we needed in order to put these things in place. So we have fiscal support. Um, as Justin said, we have an awesome school psych team with three of us, our interns and our GAs to assist as well. Um, we also have a very positive climate. Um, when I first was brought on board, um, I was, it was explained to me that there's always a seat at the table, no matter what that table is. 
And that is just um, very um, inspiring to me and is, has been a great experience for me as well. Um, we also have um, professional communication. So communication with our admin team and our teachers. Um, and it's been a great um, sense of um, fulfillment too, to be able to um, share thoughts and ideas and have them be heard. Um, they seek our input on matters that impact our students. So we've definitely been involved in the literacy initiatives as well as behavioral initiatives. Um, we've had opportunities to become letters trainers. Um, Angela is an Apple OG um, certified um, instructor as well, um, PADS trainers, et cetera. So we've had a lot of great experiences that are going to support our students, our teachers and our administration here. We're working alongside the team of administrators and teachers to impact the system. We're making sure to put equitable practices in place to bridge that opportunity gap for all of our students. So our superintendent often um, will say the uh, quote that's here on the screen, there are two things that people hate, change and the way things are. I don't know about all of you, but it's definitely true. So people will complain about how things are, but as soon as change is kind of invoked, they're apprehensive and not quite ready for it. Um, so being change agents um, in this system has been awesome and trying to work with people, um, but it has come with some roadblocks as well. So we just need to make sure we're um, being mindful of that and working forward with our staff. Um, I was just reminded we did some intern interviews last week and I can't remember which professor said it, but um, this person said it to us um, to be generally useful. And you know, I, I always think that and make sure that I'm trying to be generally useful. So in my work every day, if we had a roadblock, I'm like, okay, so how can I be a person to help this scenario move along? So how can I be that um, force of being useful? Um, I think those are all my notes for this slide. So I'll let Shelly move on to the next. Thanks, April. Good morning. Yeah. So um, as everyone up to me has kind of talked about is there is a system in place for all of these things to happen, which I would agree with Ange has probably been the biggest thing for me to be successful here because that system allows us to operate in all of the different roles instead of, you know, slide in here, slide in there that I was used to where I was before. So as our roles have been redefined, we've been able to, you know, look at those um, organization and evaluation of service delivery. We've looked at physical personnel, fiscal support system, professional communication, supervision, peer consultation. I could go on and on and on. Um, we've done a lot with professional development, um, but something that with change comes, like April had mentioned, roadblocks and how do you navigate those? So something as a team that we found helpful is the complex change chart that you see in front of you. So a lot of times when you hit a roadblock, there's that initial emotional reaction. So being able to take that away to actually be able to help to figure out why is it happening? Because everyone got into this profession to help kids learn. That's why we're all here. So it's not about the adults, it's not about the emotions, but it's about something. So we've looked at the change chart. And so if you say, you know what, I was working with a, this group of teachers and I sense a lot of anxiety around what's happening. You go back to the chart and you figure out where, where can we intervene to help with this? And so if it's anxiety, we see that it might be that maybe there aren't skills there by no one's fault, just maybe we don't have them yet. So we would look there and figure out what type of professional development or coaching we need to help within the system to get to a place where the change can happen. So that to me has been really beneficial in, in my position because, you know, before it was more like, okay, why aren't they, why aren't we just doing this? And now we're able to operate in that system, use the change chart to continue to move forward. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Ange to the next slide. All right, so database decision making and accountability. Um, as I, I found so many memes that kind of captured where we were previously to where we are now. So I felt oftentimes whenever I was in the rat wheel, it was playing whack-a-mole and it was really feeling very inefficient because it was like just problems kept popping up everywhere and you asked for data and it was as though maybe you had three heads. And so it's like, we really have to focus on being prescriptive about making decisions for kids. and going back to that complex change chart, that was a challenge. And we've been educating our teachers on so many different layers of MTSS, 
but also why it's so important for us not to just go with our guts because these are children's lives that are at stake. This is not a small decision. This is not something you just make on gut intuition. So we've really focused on making sure that data permeates all of the layers of the work that we do and it's built into our system so that at every layer of intervention, we have information that we can access, whether it's e emotional behavioral data or whether it is our Acadians data that we can look at to really help guide and drive our intervention. And so um, we've had to do a lot of coaching and support to help ease the digestion of the data because that was something that I know even in line with talking about Acadians assessment results and why that's a really good cake tester to say, is our cake baked enough or does it need to bake more? Do we need to rework the recipe a little bit? Um, because there was just a lack of understanding of the reliability and validity of the use of the tool. So we've had to do a lot of coaching around the data, but then also in helping our teams understand and interpret it. And then further using that progress monitoring data to say if we're on track for success with either our whole system, a group of kids, and that's what I said, you can zoom out as far as the whole system or in as finite as one student. And then lastly was development of our data teaming structure so that we were able to bring teachers together to not only look at individual students in the problem solving process, but we really needed to look at tier one as a whole in the absence of student names. At that point, it's just us saying, what is a core, um, in our core instruction are we doing really well? And are we hitting that 80%? And if not, what can we do to make sure that we're providing that high quality core instruction? Um, so our data really helped us do that. And it's been an ongoing conversation. Sometimes we joke that we're in the twilight zone uh, because they feel like we have the conversation often and every day and we're streaming it sometimes, but we get there and that's how we all learn. And I think that that complex change chart allowed us to not take some of those conversations personally. Like we talked about this, why aren't they getting it? But it's really because this isn't the background knowledge that our teachers have been equipped with. And we also had to redefine talking about our role redefinitions. They came from a school psych team that was test place, write reports, go to meetings. And so there was a lot of like, well, why are our school psychologists doing this work? So um, this was the other big part of our changes in our system. April, you're next. Okay, thank you. So looking at our coaching um, in the Indiana Area School District, so we definitely provide a lot of um, like light coaching or PD, um, as Andrew's talking about through, um, you know, our literacy initiatives, our SEL initiatives, but we've also had a focus on how can we um, embed coaching into our MTSS system. Um, so we have been doing um, just some direct coaching. We've been doing some grade level or classroom coaching. And again, at that systems level. So as we're looking at our data with our teams, um, there's often discussion about things uh, within the tier one, or there are more individualized questions about groups of students or individual students. Um, so we are trying to create a culture where um, teachers are feeling comfortable with requesting coaching from us. Um, we would like that collaboration, um, not a system where it's like, you you know, the principal or someone in administration is saying to the teachers, you have to have coaching. We feel like people will be more open to accepting um, coaching as they see that as a partnership, um, which really is, is how we're trying to um, set that up. We uh, have researched instructional coaching and know that, you know, there's a very strong effect size for instructional coaching, and it really does impact the education and the progress of our students. Um, so we did set up just a really simple Google request form um, for teachers. They can complete that, submit it, and then we get back to them, um, you know, within a week or so to set up a time to talk um, and do some observations and then work with them on their instructional plans. Um, as I said, we really want to create that partnership with them and have, um, you know, a, a the setup where it's uh, us collaborating together. Um, and it's more than just that initial meeting. We're following through with helping them collect data, monitor progress, and see their student growth. All right, Shelly, you're up. Thank you. So just as um, Ange had mentioned that interpreting data isn't something that everyone knows how to do, digesting research isn't either. So a big um, goal of ours has been to teach others to be effective consumers of research 
that's a way that we can help to continue to move forward with effective instructional practices. So through our data teaming model, we talk about, okay, so if we're looking at WERF as being an area that we need to continue to grow in, what are some instructional practices that we should be using? And so, you know, I know everyone has heard about popcorn reading and those types of things. We don't want to do those. So we want to teach people how to look at the different interventions or different strategies that have that research backing behind them. So something that we have done here is we look at this through our chow model. So we look at it curriculum level, instruction, assessment, and operation. We use data and research-based programs across our tiers, including within that data teaming process. We are continuing to provide robust ongoing professional development. We do that in a few different ways. One is through a PLC model that all of our teachers are enrolled in. They work with their principal to determine which PLC to join. And we have a range of options of what that might look like. One um, that our team is, um, you know, a big part of is the science of reading. We look at database decision making. So those are just a few offerings that we have. We also are doing something called 20 minute takeaways and sound well socials. So those are the more here and now. So every few weeks we schedule at the buildings where we go in and we will have a topic that is just a quick, you know, we'll present a little bit, have some discussion and maybe have a make and take, or maybe we use that time to set up opportunities to get into classrooms to provide additional coaching or meetings, but it's just, you know, giving that little bit of information so it's not all at once, because I think that that can be a more effective way to get the ball rolling in some areas. Um, another thing that we had done, which was really a cool experience for me, I, I think for the rest of the team also, we were able to structure our summer program this past year and this year coming up, we'll be doing the same thing by looking at our end of the year data, and we essentially created almost a little school for the summer where we took our data at the end of the year and we grouped students to provide targeted interventions so we could maximize the time that we had them in front of us. We also took the opportunity to hone our coaching skills by working with teachers. Um, a lot of teachers that had taught during our summer programming were brand new to the field. So we were able to provide coaching. We were able to work on that data piece. We provided progress monitoring. So it allowed us to hone our skills. And at the end of the day, our data was awesome and students made progress. So it shows that the initiatives that we're using are, are absolutely working. I will go ahead and turn it back over to Ange. Thank you. And to add to that too, I think that building trust piece was so important because we did not have a lot of requests for coaching to start. And now we start and we use a Google form and we've also really worked hard to explain we're on the teacher contract. So we talk about that trust and how we're there to support them in being successful. So that trust piece has definitely drummed us up some more business. Um, so the next layer of what I wanted to talk about is how we've been able to streamline everything um, within our MTSS system, which I would give a lot of credit to this to Justin. I don't know if you want to chime in on this slide, because I feel like this has kind of been his baby. Um, so if you want to jump in, Justin, we'd be, I feel like you've done such a remarkable job building this um, as our special, special ed director. Um, do you want to chime in on this slide? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think um, I think what we've been able to do is I think we've been able to really focus in. I think when uh, Ann Shelley and I got to the district, there was not a whole lot happening as far as school wide positive behavior support or social emotional learning program. Uh, in fact, uh, PBIS was partially in place in one of our six buildings, uh, and that was in 2019. And um, so we've really worked to build those, those tier one. We're still building tier one programming uh, across the district, uh, but we've also uh, you know, integrated paths as our SEL curriculum at the elementary levels. Um, again, introduced, and, and we've took a little bit of time you know, across the district um, as far as implementing a screener. Um, we implemented our primary buildings the first year. Uh, now we're implementing it at every building with exception of the high school. Um, but we're implementing a screener, uh, and that screener is giving us information on which students uh, might have, you know, a medium or high risk for internalized or externalized behaviors. And, uh, you know, once those students are uh, identified as needing additional supports, 
we're looking at how do we support them and we're, we're selecting evidence-based interventions um, that are kind of tailored to those students' needs. And what we found, at least within our district from our SRSS, was that there were um, three or four big issues that, that came up from our SRSS. Uh, those four being uh, aggression, um, anxiety, trauma, and um, uh, just the need for uh, you know, positive reinforcement or you know, for students that are attention seeking. So the, those being the, the, the big ideas from our, from our data, we've selected some evidence-based interventions. Uh, we use coping CAT to, to help uh, with students that are experiencing anxiety. We use uh, CAT for, for adolescents that are experiencing anxiety. Uh, we do skill streaming for those students that need support with, with, um, um, with social skills, anger control training. And that was a really, um, I, in my opinion, I think it was a really great training because it, it covered three big areas. One being, you know, how to, to do skill streaming. Um, the other one um, was aggression control uh, and or anger control. And then the other one was uh, moral reasoning training. Um, so that was really good for all of our staff. We even had, we had all of our school psychologists trained and our guidance counselors. Um, so we have, you know, a good bit of support there uh, that can help students. Uh, and then we've also been working a, a good deal on tier three supports. And um, we've been working on, you know, it, how to create individual student safety plans, you know, those FBA plans. What can you do before you, uh, what can staff members do before they uh, do an, a full-blown FBA? And there's a lot of things that, you know, that we can do to kind of get additional data and information. Uh, but sorry to, to, to take up too much time. Angela, you know, I get really passionate about it <laughs> and I'll go on all that's day. Why, <laughs> that's why I couldn't present this slide because this has been all of your work. And there, I just did answer a question in the chat. We didn't go to the high school level yet because we started year one was in one of our K-3 buildings. So our district is comprised of two K-3 buildings, two, four, five buildings, <clears throat> a junior high, which is grade six through eight, and then a senior high nine through 12. And so we know the adage of don't screen unless you can intervene. So we really wanted to make sure that we had our staff well-trained to be able to deliver interventions um, and then a plan in place for us to be able to meet the needs of those students. So, yeah. And, and just, to, just to add in there, Ange, um, you know, as far as why not the high school yet, we've, we've been working on building a, a tier one PBIS at, at our high school. Uh, and that's, that's kind of been our focus at the moment. And additionally, just to kind of add in, um, although we aren't screening there yet, we are providing some interventions. Um, there are students that we are providing some different counseling services to, you know, and, and doing those behavioral interventions. So we are providing services. We just aren't screening yet as we build that system. All right. And I know we said we take questions at the end. I feel like this one's relevant. It's who's delivering these interventions. So we have um, the school counselors have been trained, the school psychologists have been trained, and then we also have partnered with ACRP, and we have individuals there who are trained to deliver the interventions as well. And if you're not familiar with ACRP, and ACRP is, is one of our local mental health providers. All right, so April, you are next. All right, thank you guys. So moving into family, school, and community collaboration. Uh, so one of the awesome things that um, has already been brought up that we got to talk about a little bit is our summer program that we implemented last year uh, to just impact some of this uh, learning loss that we saw from COVID. Um, but I think it, it did a little more than that. Um, I know um, from my perspective, building partnerships with our local YMCA, um, and then also getting to know staff that I hadn't met before and other partners in the community um, that would come into the summer program was awesome. So I, I felt like that was a great, um, you know, collaboration with our community that we were able to be a, a, a part of last year. We also um, work in our buildings with the APTT. Um, recently, we put together a presentation presentation for parents about the science of reading um, and just some um, really um, easy takeaways from that that they could be practicing at home with their kids um, that are learning to read. So we did that at the ARC um, here in Indiana County and I think we'll repeat that at our next APTT. Um, we also like to put out products to explain um, and just be very visible about what we're doing with our literacy initiative. Um, so one of the um, products that we did 
put out last year. Um, you can see there on the screen, it's how we teach reading. Um, and it's a very comprehensive um, you know, pamphlet that was put together to explain exactly why we're doing the things we are with our literacy initiative. Um, some other things that we add to the website are, you know, are great um, ways to communicate with our families. Um, and then I think just building those connections through our meetings um, with families here in the community has been super helpful as well. And Shelly and Ange, if you had any other thoughts on that one, you can add on there. Okay, so I think, although I love all of the slides, I think this one might be my absolute favorite because from the start of all of this, our goal has been to provide equitable practices for all students in order to close the opportunity gap. And when we say all, we mean all. We aspire to provide students what they need, when they need it, through our systems of tiered supports. In the area of literacy, we have been able to shift our core curriculum to be in line with the science of reading and we've been able to adopt um, CKLA, which is Core Knowledge Language Arts. It allows students to continue to grow their knowledge while building foundational reading skills. So now all students are exposed to topics such as the Roman Empire or Westward Expansion or the solar system. I could go on and on with the amazing um, you know, knowledge that kids gain from that. And this is instead of some students reading about bears at a picnic while others continue to grow robust knowledge in lots of areas. So that to me has been something I've been very passionate about um, for all of our students. And then in the area of SEL, we've already mentioned we have the PATHS curriculum as our core. So all students are exposed to that. And students are getting these things through tier one up through tier three based upon where the needs are. Um, we, again, we go back to our data analysis and through our MTSS model, we provide hope and opportunities to all. And to me, that is the most rewarding part of my job is being able to say we're helping all students, not just the select group where we're not waiting to see where there are behavior problems We're intervening early and often. So I will turn it over to Ange with that. All right, so um, I recently attended a presentation by Dr. Tracy Whedon. Um, well, there were many. It was the kickoff for um, the launch of Science of Reading book on Saturday. And one of the things that she said that really moved me was um, talking about students who don't have the ability to read won't have a seat at the table. And there is so much truth in that because if we don't equip our students with the skills that they need to be successful, members of society and to be able to have the skills to even have a seat. Um, if you're not able to read, the likelihood that you'll have a seat at the table is not quite the case. And so in our district, we are readying seats for our students who will be equipped with the tools they need for current and future success. And that um, the bottom line for us is that it's certainly hard work, um, but it's absolutely good and rewarding work. And I feel like, you know, some days, as a team, we're like, oh my gosh, how did we survive that? But I think it's because of our team. And I think it's because we've been able to take those domains of practice, plop them in an organizational um, system that is values all of the work that we're doing and values moving our whole system forward. And so I would agree with what Justin said at the start, it's that our team has really allowed this to work um, and just finding your people. But it's absolutely worth every single set second of it for our students. And that's all we have for you today. All right, thank you so much, Indiana Area School District team. That was excellent. If we were in person, we would all be clapping loud. I'd encourage everyone to click your little reactions button, give them your little clap or um, whatever, whatever reaction you want, love, thumbs up. That was excellent, excellent, excellent. So I think that you address the questions thus far in the chat by responding. So thank you so much, Indiana team. A lot of positive feedback coming in. Um, there is a question popping in real quick. What progress monitoring tools do you use in math at this time? Um, that's a great question. So we just recently added Acadian's math to our universal screening, and um, we're slowly moving in the direction of expanding our math interventions and doing the same that we've been doing in reading. So that is what we've been focused on um, primarily, but we're still building that. 
Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the State College area team. Thanks, Erica. Hi, everyone. Um, it's hard to match and compete with what, not that we're competing with uh, what we just heard, but it was also pretty inspirational. Several of the stories that um, Indiana was sharing are very similar to the journey that uh, we have here. And, and, and we may not even get to touch on all of the pieces, but um, we, thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Jonathan Klingeman. I'm the Director of Federal Programs and Gifted Services for the State College Area School District. And I'm going to share my screen and introduce uh, the school psychologists that are here with me today. And um, give me just one second to make sure I'm sharing the right one here. All right. Can everyone see everything okay? Yes. Okay, awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, so I'm here today with uh, three of our school psychologists. Uh, one of them is Dr. Rachel Lego. She is the school psychologist at Park Forest Middle School here in State College. I'm here with Dr. Megan Hutchinson, school psychologist at Spring Creek Elementary School. And I'm also here with Dr. Uh, Kathleen Colby Holden, and spring, or, um, school psychologist at our Delta program, which is an alternative middle school high school program here in State College. Um, so again, I just wanted to shout out to Indiana for their awesome presentation, and it, it's reassuring for the challenges that you're going through and the growth, uh, very similar to what we have kind of been experiencing, and, um, and a little bit about uh, our next steps as well. So um, just a little bit about State College here in Central Pennsylvania, serving the Penn State University community with about 6,800 students. Um, eight elementary schools, K to five, two middle schools, our high school, nine to 12, and as I had mentioned, that Delta program. Uh, we are extremely blessed to have 11 full-time school psychologists working within our system. And um, similarly to what we had kind of heard from Indiana, it has been um, the, the, the growth and the better understanding of the role of the school psychologist, which has helped um, our team administrative team to better understand and, and respect the role and to see it as more than just test in place. In fact, uh, we've actually had some administrators in our past that kind of see the role as more of test in place and we have pushed back on that and have really tried to um, help our school administrators and principals to see the, see the difference and to see that when you're going to become a principal and you're getting your certificate, there really isn't much education, or at least in mine, learning about MTSS, school psychology, and um, how to be uh, an expert in that field. So uh, we've really been relying heavily on our school psychologists to help uh, with that piece. Um, our population uh, demographics is listed there, and I'd like to um, pull your attention specifically. We're going to be talking today um, about our gifted education program, uh, which has changed drastically in the past four years um, and has also led to a little bit of the um, support that we have for additional school psychologists um, and our path moving forward. Um, in terms of the way that we use our school psychologist, in addition to helping support um, testing students, um, we include them on several of our district wide committees. Uh, specifically, um, during COVID, our school psychologists were used heavily with our school counseling department and um, several um, other groups from Penn State University to help figure out solutions for um, providing additional supports for students um, during COVID. Um, that also included supports for, for teachers and other professionals and staff as well. Um, we are currently in our finalizing our, uh, our five-year renewal of our RTI for SLD application, uh, which has grown um, for the past, I think, 10 years. We have been um, an RTI for SLD approved school district. Um, we currently are approved for K-3, to but we are in ELA. Uh, we are, in fact, growing that this year to K-5 to ELA. Um, we do not have a strong system for mathematics at this point, but we are, uh, that is on our radar and something that we want to get into as well. Um, I'm thinking of all the things I heard from Indiana. I'm like, oh, similar, similar, similar. So uh, again, we do use the Acadian's um, Acadian system for our universal screening software in our, in our elementary and are starting to um, look at our secondary MTSS systems, which at this point are, um, I don't want to say not there at all, they're there in pieces. And what we're trying to do is really to pull, pull that piece through. So we're having bigger discussions um, with MTSS um, K-12 as a district, uh, given our new leadership changes that have occurred. 
And then finally, our school psychologists uh, meet monthly with me um, to talk about um, everything related to school psychology, um, special education, gifted education, and are leading in additional conversations uh, similarly to Greens to Indiana around uh, the science of literacy. Uh, we're hoping to get into the science of math in the future as well, uh, and 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 growing into. Um, into that piece. So they, they really are a valuable, valuable resource in our school district and, and we're pretty thankful to have them. So Megan. Um, so I'm the kind of representing the elementary world here from State College. Um, like Jonathan mentioned, we have eight different elementary schools. Um, so when we talk about MTSS and a process, um, just because of the fact that there are eight, eight different schools, it ends up looking a little bit different in each building. And I think something that is our goal as school psychologists is to try to get as much consistency as possible between our buildings. Um, we've had instructional support teachers and an instructional support process for a really long time in this district. And I think something that um, the school psychologists have been trying to do is shift that um, individual problem solving child model to more of an MTSS discussion about grade level data, um, class wide data um, on a regular basis, just like we have always scheduled individual problem solving team discussions on individual kids, just so that we can be more efficient and use more resources. Um, so that being said, um, at the elementary level, the school psychologists are really involved in the MTSS process, um, especially for reading. Um, we've included some links to our tiered supports that we have for reading, social emotional behavioral, attendance, mental health, and we also um, do provide math interventions um, as well. Um, like Jonathan said, we're approved to use um, RTI for SLD eligibility and K3. Um, we've had a lot of support from the Penn State um, School Psychology Program. Our practicum students had really helped push that off the ground when we were first getting started like over a decade ago to help provide the reading interventions. Um, so thinking back to what Indiana was talking about in that change chart, like resources was, was a big column in there. And so that was one way our district was really creative with um, you know, what can we tap into into the community that's available? And we had a nice partnership um, with Penn State and doing that for a long, long time. Um, in terms of our behavioral, social, emotional MTSS, um, our elementary and middle schools are doing school-wide positive behavior support. And Rachel and then Katie will talk about what secondary looks like a little bit. We have restorative practices district-wide. Um, we're using second step um, at the elementary level as a tier one support. The classroom teachers are doing it and our counselors do um, lessons once a month in each classroom. We also have our ESAP process to coordinate the mental health piece <clears throat> in the community. Um, and then we also have our mental health providers put our liaisons um, that sit in on our MTSS meetings every week in the building. Um, so just to give you an example of like our elementary teaming structure, Jonathan, can you click on that link? So this is an example of our team, and this is what we're really working um, to try and do instead of more of a individual student referral um, by teachers and then schedule a team meeting with parents um, for an hour. We're really trying to get our core team to meet more regularly so we can communicate better about student need and also kind of triage the problems um, because we were spending just as much time on students who were ready to go to an evaluation as we were for students who were barely below benchmark, but the teacher was really having trouble with attention. So we really tried to rework our core team and going through those referrals and talking about, okay, let's do some observations. Megan's gonna follow up with the teacher and work with them and consult on a behavior plan. And then we'll talk about it in four weeks and we'll see if we need to bring the parents in based on the progress. Um, you can see we have like our data team meetings for benchmarking on there, um, for our tiered supports, it's more focused on progress monitoring 
um, those individual students as opposed to the benchmarking meetings where we talk about more grade level whole school um, data. And then at the bottom is more of that, what our district and our teachers know is like the IST meetings. Um, and again, that's been kind of a big mindset shift for our district because it's really been ingrained in the practice. Um, so that's kind of where, and from an elementary standpoint, as the, as the psych, I'm really trying to move my team into this type of structure. Um, so that's something that I think we're making strides with, um, but it's definitely been a shift. Um, and having everybody even understand that MTSS is not something new. <laughs> We've been doing a lot of these things with RTI for a long time. It's just under that umbrella. Um, so when you're talking about change and expanding the role, you know, just giving people that vision and the skills um, to use the Acadians data. So those are all things that we've been working on at the elementary level. I wanted to add real quick to Me Megan real quick is the, um, the, the consistency piece is something that I'm pretty passionate about. And um, our curriculum director and I um, are, are working with our assistant superintendents to really make sure that there is uh, fidelity that is coming to these systems. And, and through our RTI for SLD application process, that was probably the number one thing that we have lost in terms of transition from several different administrators and new teachers and new principals over the course of the year. And using our, um, we've just updated our student management, or I'm sorry, our uh, students. Um, student instructional system, our management system for student information, student information system, there it was, I knew I'd get it out. Um, and we're going to be really relying on using those tools within that to hold um, accountability to fidelity and having more consistency for processes, uh, data collection, access to data, etc. as we continue to move forward. And I, I do see that there's a, a, a chat in here about uh, listing this team structure, we'll be glad to get all of these documents out to Erica to be able to have, have for everybody. Okay, thanks. So I'm um, Rachel. I'm the school psychologist at one of our middle level buildings. We have two middle schools um, that are larger middle schools. So my middle school, for example, has um, about 800 kids. And then we also have the Delta Middle Program, which is our alternative middle school. So um, Jonathan, do you mind clicking on that first link there, example? So this document came out of our work um, over the summer for the past two summers actually on our student wellness team, it kind of came out of COVID. And um, I think, you know, at the heart of our expanding, expanding our role um, as school psychologists is really being integral in all these parts of MTSS. And so I thought this was a nice way. This is um, an activity that each building did to really map out where our resources are for um, these four different areas. And so I just wanted to provide this, it's kind of an overview, it's an, um, another option beyond that triangle, but very similar. So it, um, the green is what we have in place for our tier one, yellow obviously is tier two and tier three in all four of these different areas. So um, Megan talked about that a little bit. Um, we have been doing our school-wide positive behavior support for quite a while at, at the middle level. Um, for the past, I would say maybe three or four years, we've um, been implementing second step at the middle level and had a universal behavioral screening. We use the BESS screening um, and students fill that out on their own. And so we have that for looking at um, social emotional as a screener. Academics, we use our MAP assessment three times a year as a benchmarking. And then based on that, um, the students that are scoring below um, around the 30th or 35th percentile, then we drill down with more assessments for academics. So I would say like our behavior and our social, emotional, mental health supports have been established for a longer period of time um, than what our academics are. We are just this year um, is our first year implementing academic intervention for reading and for math um, at the middle level and progress monitoring that. So we're very new into that process. Just wanted to provide this as a resource. So, you know, I've been at this middle school now for um, almost 15 years, and I will say this has been a process ever since I started. So when I first started here, um, it was very much like teachers would just come to me and make referrals. And then based on what they said, I would determine if the student needed to be evaluated. So we've, this has kind of been in the works for a long time, but I wanted to just, just provide an example of what our intervention processes. If you don't mind clicking on that first link, 
And even though we've been working on this for a very long time, I will say this is definitely a work in progress. So um, in terms of the teaming structure at the middle level, our middle school is divided, um, like I said, it's about 800 kids. It's divided into smaller teams. So we have seven teams, two and six, two and seventh, two and eighth, and then we have a cross seventh and eighth grade team. And so I think that that teaming structure really helps us with this intervention process um, because the teachers meet at three times a week um, or three times per six day cycle and um, talk about whatever they need to talk about going on in their team. One of those days is de um, devoted to talking about student concerns. And so with this process, the team is able to discuss their concerns and then they fill out information on the student day meeting form where they can um, indicate what types of supports they're trying in tier one. If those supports don't work um, and with consultation from me and from the school counselors, we're part of that consultation process as they're designing their tier one interventions. They try those for a period of four to six weeks. If they don't work, um, can you scroll down just a little bit there? They can either modify that or that's when they make a request for assistance to our um, MTSS team. Our MTSS team is con um, consists of myself. We have three counselors at, at my middle level building and then we have two building level administrators. And so we meet every week to talk about um, student concerns and information that's coming out of these student day meetings from the different teams. And so um, it really helps us to kind of keep a pulse on what's going on. The counselors are the ones that attend all of those student day meetings, I don't. And so they're kind of, we work really closely together um, so I can hear what's going on at those meetings and help consult as needed. And then um, this middle level intervention tracking form, this is the student day meeting form. And so um, this is designed to be a problem solving form. So that was a really big mind shift for the teams and it still is continuing to be. Uh, a lot of times it just seems like those team meetings aren't super productive because it just is talking a lot about the problem and gets less more like less into the problem solving framework. And so this form, um, we don't need to go through the whole thing, but it's designed to collect information at the start of a concern and then really um, document what interventions they're trying in tier one. After those tier interventions, then that's when they come to um, make the referral to our uh, core MTSS team. All right, thanks, Jonathan. So this is um, the teaming structure. This is what it looks like at the middle level. So we have that smaller core team that meets weekly, and then we have an extended MTSS that's um, definitely multidisciplinary with uh, people from the community, our school social worker, emotional support teachers. That's a larger team where we talk about more complex cases and what we should do. Um, yep, you can head to the next slide there, Jonathan. Okay. Um, I know there's some questions about the family involvement piece. We'll circle back to that at the end because I do want Megan to speak to that. That is definitely specifically at our elementary. I, I know that if, if, if uh, Rachel or Katie, you have anything you want to say at the secondary, but in the elementary specifically with the RTI piece, uh, we're, we're moving forward with including uh, family involvement as a, a fidelity requirement for tier three um, if they're not already involved at more of a tier two level. Hi, so I'm Katie. Um, I actually cover the Delta program, which is our six through 12 uh, democratic school program. I also assist um, a school site that we have at the at state high, our high school. Um, I also cover our right program, which I'll talk a little bit about um, within the slide. And then I cover our partial hospitalization program that we have in the district as well, which is K through five. And then we also have a program called LifeLink, which is a program that supports our older students with disabilities, um, where they're able to to take some classes at Penn State with support and they're able to work on independent living skills in an apartment and with coaches. Um, so it's a really great program that we have in the district. Um, I actually, my background, I started out in Pennsylvania as a school counselor and then moved um, to various states and got my school psych degree and worked as a school psychologist. I will say that high schools, I would say this is not unique to Pennsylvania. I would probably across the nation have processes and supports for students, but at the high school level definitely need more refinement and more um, work on how students move through tiers and how do we support students at that high school level. Um, particularly in those behavioral uh, mental health pieces, I think academically in high school, you know, the students have those course choices, so that kind of works out. However, those other pieces at high school level that I have seen kind of are, need a lot more work. Um, so Jonathan, if you could click on that link to the example, 
So similar to the middle schools, we also have an example of some things that are available at tier one, tier two, and tier three for students. Um, and again, I we have we need to work more as a team um, on refining these and working how students go to each tier. Um, and that was really started prior to COVID. And then similar to what someone said in the chat, also kind of fell apart. So we're we're working back to getting on board with all of these and working on what programs do we have. We are very fortunate here in State College. We have have the university we have tons of mental health supports um, but we really need some work some work on filtering who goes where so that um, you know students are getting what they need fully um, so that's the area we definitely need to work on we do have a universal screener at the high school level and we are lucky that we have a mental health team through Penn State which are mental health interns that are working on either their master's or their doctorate in clinical counseling and um, through that screener we go through that screener we're able to um, allow students to access counseling for six to eight weeks through that. And then those um, interns with their supervisor are able to determine if the student needs referred to community services. So I think that's been a really great thing that we've been able to implement at the high school level and support students with. Um, because a lot of teams are saying, if we don't have the supports, how are we gonna screen? And then we have all these students that we aren't sure what to do with. So, and you can go ahead back there, Jonathan. So these are just some examples we have as tier two supports at our high school level. Um, now Delta does look a little different than state high does. We're working on kind of getting those together as well. Again, the big dis district and the consistency does sometimes become difficult, but that's what we're working through. And it is helpful that I'm at multiple places because I can connect with multiple administrators and we can work through some of these things. Um, one of our interesting tier two supports is uh, called ACE tutoring. And so this is an assigned um, schedule it, assigned during the day to students um, who have so many failing grades. So it originally started out as an academic executive functioning type study hall. However, um, what they quickly realized when we had the groups of students in there is that there's a lot of emotional support that's also needed for these students. So the district has hired a clinical mental health counselor um, that district uh, that counselor does have um, a caseload of students but is also able to support ACE during the day for our students who need that emotional support in that classroom um, to catch those students up. Something implemented this year is called the Lions Learning Lounge. And this has been a great thing for students. Um, it is after school, it's four to six, Monday through Thursday. Um, the students can get academic support. So Monday, Thursday, they can get English and math support and Tuesday, Wednesday, they can get science and social studies support. Um, our community agencies are also offering social emotional groups within this time frame after school. Um, so there are strength based groups, there's relaxation groups, just general peer connection groups, uh, identity exploration groups, they have peer advocates working there. Um, the CTC, which is our technical school actually has an honor national honor society and they, they do tutoring there for students in our CTC school. So this has been a really great thing for students um, and partnering, partnering with those community supports. Um, we of course have our SAP teams at that secondary level where we would refer students. Um, as I mentioned, we have a secondary mental health clinician, which has been great. Um, we have the mental health interns, which we're partnering with Penn State University for. I believe we have 12 interns this spring. Um, so that is a lot of students that we are able to serve through that program. Another program which uh, can be tier two or tier three, it kind of fits in both, is our right program. It's called Reclaiming Individual Talent. Um, these students, um, it's either these students who have some type of disciplinary infraction where they are essentially expelled from the high school, um, or students who have difficulty with truancy coming to school with social emotional needs mixed in, so they don't necessarily have to have that disciplinary piece involved. Um, students there are working on a virtual platform to gain their credits. And then there are also counselors and counseling groups that are over there to help the students work through their social emotional needs. Um, so that is a program that I work very closely with. We just got a, counsel a school counselor over there this year and that has been really great to have consistency as far as a counselor in that program. Um, for teaming at the high school level, so we have CAT teams. These teams are really the school counselors because just like school psychologists, we have a lot of school counselors. Um, so each counseling team has an administrator that works with them. Um, they go through students and take a problem solving approach and, and talk about interventions that have been done. And then they talk about moving these students to what is called our casing 
casings team. And the casings team really is that MTSS team for those students who really need some individual problem solving. Um, on our casings team, we include our social workers, we include um, an outside community mental health liaison, um, our special education teachers, depending if the student is involved in special education. So, and, and I also work on that team. So in that team, we can actually problem solve um, where we can help that student in certain ways. Um, and that may be a precursor to looking at rights or looking at getting them, getting the students on the mental health intern caseload, um, just really helping those students who are at that next level. The other team we have um, is called our unique casings team. And so these are students who may come from out of state or students who are behind in credits. And this is where we can look specifically at what credits does a student need for graduation and piece things together to get that student to to meet those graduation requirements. So they might have a 0.25 of social studies and a 0.5 of math. What do we need the student to do as far as what do they need to have left of, of to graduate and we can put some credits together there to figure out how to get them there. Katie, can you talk briefly about the mental health interns and where like some of the services they're providing? And this is um, this is something that has been growing rapidly uh, in the past couple of years now. It has been growing. So when it started, um, we had a, um, our director of equity and inclusivity, she was actually supervising that program. So we only had a few mental health interns that were seeing students. Um, and they we were referring the students from our MTSS, our casing teams, which would be our MTSS teams. Um, we quickly realized that there were many referrals that needed to uh, we needed assistance with um, and that it was difficult for our director to do um, her job that she needed to do and supervise all these students and communicate with all the various secondary teams. So actually this year, um, I think it was the end of last year, um, someone from Penn State came on board to supervise them. Yep, it operates out of the HER clinic. Um, so their, their professor through the HER clinic is supervising these master's level students. Um, we put, put, put together a process, a referral form. Um, there is a team that meets on Fridays to, re to um, review those referrals. So they go through those referrals and determine whether the student meets the criteria to be able to be referred to one of the master's level students. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, before we shift to the next part of our conversation, Megan, did you want to jump in with anything more about family involvement in the different tiers, at least in the elementary or any of you? Sure. I can say something um, to that. I think when, and from an academic standpoint, we really try and make sure we have a sit, like, sit down or in these days virtual meeting with parents when we move kids to like a tier three level of support. Um, and I think that process is more um, structured on the academic side. Um, when it comes to more of the mental health, social, emotional, behavioral, I feel like it's more fluid. And um, I know I end up talking to the families a lot along the way, um, just depending on the severity of what's going on with the kids. Um, so I don't know that it's, so it, it kind of depends on the severity of it. And I feel like we, with the social emotional behavioral, it just ends up that there's a lot more family involvement earlier on, because as we know, a lot of that home stuff is, comes into school and our parents may be reaching out too. Um, so I think we end up having a lot more parents with a lot longer meetings for the social, emotional and behavioral piece. Um, than the academic side where we're kind of updating them be through goal conferences with the teachers. Um, our title teachers are sending home data. And then when they get to tier three, we're making sure that the family understands the amount of support that they're getting for reading or math. And then um, that if we are not seeing progress in the next like six to 10 weeks, something that may happen would be an evaluation. Um, so we like to lay the groundwork and talk about that evaluation. And I really like to be there so that they can meet me um, so that we don't like, don't spring it on them, you know, like when it's already time to start the evaluation. Um, so that's something that we're trying to just improve the consistency of that. Cause we were kind of realizing out of the different elementary levels, people were doing it differently um, for the academic side anyway. And then my hope would be to also firm up that social emotional and behavioral side as well. It just seems for some reason that like that side of the triangle just is 
messier and it's harder like you have to do a lot more like individual you know every kid is so different and their family is so different when it comes to that mental health piece too so um yeah awesome thank you so we wanted to shift gears here a little bit and um with a little fun that we've i guess learned with Patton is do a, a little activity um so we're going to be using the annotation feature on zoom um, similarly to that, if you've been in a, a patent training before, you've probably been asked to do that. So again, up in the view options part of your screen, there's that annotate button and you'll be able to click on a stamp um, or draw a picture or whatever you need to do um, for this next, uh, next couple slides. So if you want to annotate this uh, picture here, question is, why did you become a school psychologist or what is your favorite part of the job? And uh, we try to give a, a, a variety of responses here uh, to kind of see where everyone's living. So is everyone able to see that annotation feature? Perfect, there we go. We thought it'd be important to kind of gauge a little bit about the audience and where we are as we kind of shift the conversation here for our last uh, 20 minutes. I am shocked that no one went into this career for the paperwork and report writing. I am absolutely shocked by that. So I think this just, this tells me exactly why school psychologists should not be testing and placing uh, and that there are very many uh, opportunities to engage. <laughs> school psychologist into the to the school system. So that makes me feel good. So team, that was exactly what I was hoping we would see. So that's great. Um, next, uh, let me clear this. Perfect. Um, so the next question we have for you, in what two areas do you spend the most of your time? So take a look at this. And um, just guessing, going to have uh, a little bit different place for some of these or most of these. So again, we're looking for two, so you can stamp twice or where you feel you do the most. So as I think probably everyone would expect, we do see the majority of our time and efforts um, going into the evaluation and assessment piece and report writing. Um, and that's why I feel that this, when Erica had reached out for us to present to you all today, it was really important for us to get to share a little bit about what we're doing and, and how we are trying to uh, change the game so that it is not just about um, evaluation and report writing. All right. And we, I think we just wanted to put these questions in there so that you reflect. This is when Rachel and I were talking about doing this, we were thinking this might be the case. And I think that's why there's a lot of burnout and frustration. Um, and it feels almost impossible sometimes to get out from underneath the evals and the paperwork. Um, so I think we all saw that they were different responses and just kind of reflecting on why they're different and thinking about the barriers um, that you're experiencing. And if you want to pop them in the chat, you can as we go along. Um, yeah, that would be great. I'd love to just hear the barriers that people are experiencing while I kind of shift to where things really took a, a big turn for us. So back in 2000 and um, oh man, probably 2015-16, the Pennsylvania Department of Education came in and evaluated the state college area school districts chapter 16 compliance. Uh, and we were out of compliance for many, many years. We had been working in a experimental program that was kind of loosely based on Joe Renzulli and Sally Rice's model for the learning enrichment triad. Um, back in the 80s, we probably had five, six, 700 GIEPs or gifted plans, even though they weren't technically under Pennsylvania law at that point. And through the enrichment program, which was offering supports for all students at tier one, tier two, and at a tier three level, um, students were getting, you know, supports. Um, 
I kind I came into the role um, as there was transition into the district creating a role specifically for gifted services. Um, at that time, I have now then also picked up all federal programs, ESL, school psychology, and MTSS. So my role has completely changed a little bit over the course of the uh, the time that I've been here in the past five to six years. But what what really took a, a big difference for us um, was taking a look at how. The, the, the state saying that you need to be following chapter 16. Um, at that point, we were not doing any sort of universal screening um, with 6,800 students and a pretty bright population. We had maybe three kids with GIEPs in the entire district and much fewer that were being tracked as being identified as gifted, whether or not they had a need or not. Um, so because of that, uh, we really took a look at our gifted universal screening process at one point in of 16, 17, we were screening um, 15, 16, 16, 17 screening several grade levels um, and using a system that, in my opinion, was not student centered necessarily. Um, there was a gate for students, um, I'm sorry, for teachers to be able to end the uh, referral process from moving forward to evaluation. And we know that research is pretty clear and it's not new research either, that teachers are not a very good um, evaluator of potential gifted, uh, of, of potential giftedness. So that's really been where we've been working in the past five to six years to better inform and train teachers on understanding gifted students. Um, our twice exceptional population is skyrocketing. And now um, the team that I support is also starting to dive a little bit deeper into uh, gifted education programming and, edu or, and equity within that system. So taking a look at uh, the disproportionality rates of gifted students, uh, black, brown, um, English language learners, and, and all of that thing as well. So those are kind of our long-term projects with that. This is also where our district really started to shift away from doing um, district-wide uh, school psychologists. At one point we had uh, a gifted only psychologist, uh, part-time gifted psychologist. It, it, it just really wasn't working for us because again, it was the inconsistencies that we were seeing between school psychologists, the evaluations and transition in general. So that's where we started to shift towards building based. And I give uh, the team of psychologists that we have here a lot of credit because um, during this transition, we've had um, a lot of ups and downs and, and really working to help support each other during, during very different, different, different times. Um, but the one thing that's really, really important to me that I have seen through this journey, because I have kind of been here through the onset of this gifted change, is that importance of that role. And given the time that I work with our reading specialists, um, title services, um, our transition to using the science of literacy, um, incorporating letters, um, training into our schools as well, um, it's been a, a critical role to have our school psychologists who, when I would meet with them, they they look at me and they like, oh, look, we're moving towards a research-based intervention. Could have told you that five years ago. Like all of these different things that our school psychologists, if we would have had them at the table from the beginning, uh, I think we would have not fallen behind, in my opinion, as much as where we were. And now I feel um, through our connections with the IU and through Patton, we are really stepping forward ahead and, and finally being able to be prepared and ahead of the game, um, specifically like, for example, in the science of literacy and the, the changes that are occurring at the state level in terms of expectations that are coming down for that. I feel that we're a little bit ahead of the game now. So I wanted to share a graphic with you that um, I share regularly um, in presentations with um, anytime I talk about gifted education, you can kind of see our, our track of where um, we've been with gifted. Um, so at this point, um, we are still trying to manage a universal screening system that is student centered and effective and um, helping building teams better understand that just because um, chapter 16 is a little black and white doesn't mean that we can't be a little bit gray in supporting students. Um, so we have completely um, gone the other direction in terms of our gifted numbers and it will still take us probably um, probably about four or five years until we get to where our, every one of our students has been fully um, screened in a, um, in a manner that I think is appropriate. And at that point, I'm guessing that we'll probably have about 10 to 12% of our school district having at least a gifted identification, whether or not they have a specific need. Um, we have a lot of programming in place to help support academic services of kids to not necessarily get rid of GIEPs, but to provide better services to all students, regardless of cognitive IQ. 
So we're still growing. Uh, currently, we're probably at about 320 um, active GIEPs, most within our elementary and our middle school system. And I think about all of those gifted evaluations that had to be done within the past five years. Uh, we currently are finishing our universal screening process, um, which this year we did two grade levels. And I thank our school psychs for being a part of that and holding on tight because it was certainly a challenge to do two complete screenings. But we kind of do a, a mock system of the whole gifted multidisciplinary evaluation, looking at a group administered screener, the, the COGAT screener, in addition to potential masking factors, looking at race, gender, um, ELL status, home language, poverty. Um, in addition to academic performance on the map. Um, and then we have additional conversations as needed if we feel that we need a, a secondary screener. Uh, we typically dive a little bit deeper for some of these kiddos on the, on the, on the border using the KBIT exam. Rachel? Yeah, I think this just highlights a little bit of our timeline of where we were and where we are now and how we got there. So, um, you know, back in 2016, 17 is when we had about seven and a half psychs there. Um, that's when we just started the new gifted screening process. And like Jonathan was saying, like that's because we had so many students that um, were screened and, and then later um, needed to be evaluated. We just had so many, um, that was just a big impetus for why we needed more school psychs to be able to handle that. So um, we talked a lot with uh, upper level administration um, to try to get that um, advocate for those positions and really presented them with data. You know, we had lots of meetings and talked about here's how many hours it takes, you know, to evaluate a student on average and here's how many evaluations we have and, you know, just try to show them like the actual bottom line. And at one point here, um, when we were down to, I think, you know, we had contracted help in 2018, 19, um, and then the next two years. And at that point, there was a point when we all the school psychs had to step back from all of our multifaceted roles within the buildings. And we had to really focus on um, our evaluations only like going back to that test in place and that was just a huge it, it was hard you know none of us wanted to do it and it was um we were really scared about taking going back from all that hard work that we had made to be integral into all of these different processes within the buildings but it really helped because the principal saw that you know all of that work that we were doing on a daily basis and so they really helped us to advocate to the upper administration like we need those school psychs to be back in the building we need them part of all of our you know, multidisciplinary teams and our data meetings. And so that really made a big difference to help us with advocating for our role is actually to take that step back that we didn't want to take initially. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I feel like this part of our presentation might seem like counterintuitive because, but it was really about being kind of opportunistic. Mm -hmm. Like we saw this huge uptick, like fourfold in evaluation needs and an opportunity to say to upper admin like there's legal legal requirements with this do you want us going over the timelines you know and doing a lot of the things that rachel was doing because in the back of our minds we really felt like if we can get the positions then we can show them all the rest of the things that we can do if we can become truly building based then we can really be integrated um into the culture of the building and the community and build the relationships that you need to start making small steps forward. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, we did, we took the opportunity because of our traditional role as being seen as test in place. Um, and then the other piece that Rachel talked about when we stepped back, that was really scary um, mm -hmm. because I mean, I, it was, it was really scary and we did it as a group. And we said, if we're, if, you know, we were also given a directive that they weren't going to contract out anymore, that we needed to take care of the evals. And if that meant not going to MTSS meetings, school-wide meetings, meeting with kids, then that was just going to be the way it was. Um, and so we did that. And a lot of um, us were like, well, if we can squeeze it in, maybe we should also go to the meetings. Maybe we should do this. And I don't know, maybe some of you would disagree, but we were kind of like, we're sticking together as United Front. And I know, and the principals also, we knew our, the principals had our had our backs that like, if you did this, um, there were gonna be like the ripple effect. Um, and we were also told it, you know, wouldn't be forever. 
but I don't know, just to give you a little bit more context, it was a really difficult time. It was a huge struggle. Um, so we, we're, we're beyond that now and we still have, you know, it kind of leads us into our next slide of like barriers and obstacles. Um, we have a lot of great things in place here in our district, elementary more so than high school. Um, our ratios at the high school, I don't know, Katie, it's like there's two of you there and how many students are at the high school? I'm not sure if we'd include Delta too, maybe around 2000, what would you say? Yeah, that? so it's more like one to 1000 at the high school. Um, and then the middle schools are a little bit less than that. Um, and then the elementary is where we have the best ratios, like one to 500. Um, so some of the things that you were putting in the chat and talking about barriers, NASP is also like recognizes those barriers to implementing the practice model. Um, we, have ad, we have admin here too that don't understand our full role. Thankfully, we have admin like Jonathan who also do understand what our area of expertise is and can help to advocate. Um, we don't have one of the struggles of historically being a district where the school psychs are test in place, especially at the elementary level. So I've been here for 10 years now um, and I came into a place where I could show a little bit more and most of my training within that practice model. Um, and a lot of these issues too, you can keep going, Jonathan. Um, we wanted to include the practice model, but Indiana talked about that. So we can go to the next slide. Um, that there are, you know, your own barriers in your district, but we also understand that there are these more macro level barriers um, because there's shortages of school psychologists right now. And there are a lot of school psychologists that train in Pennsylvania and then leave. So there are things that we can't control um, and the ratio is huge um, as well. Rachel, I think this is yours. Yeah, so I think that this slide, you know, when I started, you can't take everything on all at once. And so I wanted to think a lot about baby steps. Like, what is it that I was really passionate about? Like, I can say personally, I love working individually with kids and in groups. Like, I really love social, emotional, and behavioral supports. And I like, you know, providing counseling interventions and doing some of that. So, you know, I tried to think like, what is it? That's really what I was passionate about and consulting on implementing our school-wide positive behavior support at the tier two and three, especially with fidelity. So, you know, I think figuring out what you really want to do and how you can take small steps to get there. And so this is just talking about like, you know, knowing that that was what I really like loved the most about my job. I was trying to seek out those opportunities to get some training um, in those areas that I felt like maybe I was definitely interested in and then also maybe not as competent in or didn't have as much training in based on my grad school experience. And so that helped. And we just listed, you know, lots of options here for professional development. Um, I think that I'm going to do this one here too. So, you know, this is just some ideas. This is um, from NASP is on the left side. And then on the right side is kind of what we did to try to achieve that. So improving the ratio, it gives you some ideas here of what you can do immediately, um, longer term, and then um, the next steps, and then the longer term. So uh, we talked a little bit about this already, but presenting to the upper level administration, really getting to like the bottom line of um, the data and how much, how many hours it was taking, what our caseloads were, how our evaluations were really increasing to try to advocate for those uh, more school psychologists within the, within the district. Um, I think we talked about a lot of this already here. Um, we did use the, uh, when we looked, one of the pieces that we used to advocate for our role um, being expanded was using our evaluation rubric and just saying this is what we're being evaluated on by the state. And so we need to be able to do like this full spectrum of services uh, within our buildings. Okay, I think this is mine again. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, and there's also a question in the chat about strategies for getting admin buy-in that includes school psychs in an MTSS role. And I think this slide is at least how I did it. Um, I think sometimes um, like the context is huge and building relationships is really, really important. Um, you need an ally. Um, it's, it's somewhere along the way. 
Um, so making steps to have that ally that has that control and is a stakeholder in the power. I mean, we're all on teacher contracts, so we don't have any administrative authority at the end of the day. Um, and just finding a way, and I know we hear this a lot to like be at the table. Um, and that might be, I think I have it like in a later slide, but like it might be think of one building. And if you don't have a whole building that you feel like there's some different pieces when Indiana put that table up there with change, then is there one teacher? Is there one grade level? Is there one student? Um, and really drill down because anything you do that's outside what is traditional is a step in the right direction and can show and then you do become more visible and this is a shout out to Dave because he always said this and when he was the president of ASP that's how he always ended the ASP insight you know letter from the president and it's so true and visibility comes accountability and there is some risk with that and there are still a lot of stressors with the systems change but it's just the kind of stress that I prefer <laughs> I guess um and I think that building a relationship with the principal has been key for me. Um, it's not always easy. We don't always agree, but you have to have that mutual trust and respect. Um, and showing the training and using our PDE evaluation form also helps too. Um, and then April also talked about this, but you know, be useful. School psychologists should be generally useful. And that might be something like picking the star ticket winners for the school-wide positive behavior program every week um, that doesn't seem to be, or having a duty. Um, those are kind of those little things that can integrate you into your school community and make people see you at, and make you more relatable um, and you're present and you're visible. Um, the other thing that we have that we're really fortunate is just the strength of our group and we always pull together. Um, we always present a united front. We keep each other on our toes. Um, we have a monthly meeting and um, Jonathan's there, director of special ed is there um, probably every other meeting. And so we're always trying to talk about the evidence, talk about best practices and just be solution oriented. Um, so yeah. and. Go ahead. I, okay. Real quick, Megan, I just wanted yeah. to add in there too. Um, I also had to implement uh, a communication tool because uh, so we use Slack with our uh, school psychologist group because before that, all they would do is email their their member group back and forth their ideas, questions, thoughts, and it was like out of control. And that was quickly where I saw how valuable their conversations were. And for me, um, being uh, an administrator. And then also last year I did my role and an elementary principal. I got to overlay all of that. So that communication piece has also been one to open up lines for them to constantly be in communication with one another and not let email, which can be a big hindrance in my opinion, slow down, slow down growth and change. Yeah, so this was another one, um, recommendations from NASP. I wanted to just highlight this as something on their website, a self-assessment survey that you, that you can take. And it really walks you through the questions in each of the domains um, to try to pinpoint, like it's a little bit of a self-reflection and assessment where you can just say like, you know, helps you pinpoint what you really wanna do and how you can get there. So there's the um, self-assessment and then there's also a planning tool that you can use to try to figure out like what, what um, how you can take baby steps to get there. This is the example of what the growth plan is that, that also comes from the self-assessment. So, yeah, I don't know who wants like to start kind of with talked this. about. Yeah, I feel like yeah. we kind of talked about it throughout. Um, so you can just kind of see. I would say that this is a, for me, the hardest thing is I am so passionate about this systems level change and like trying to be um, have a seat at the table in all of these different meetings, but I will say it, it gets exhausting sometimes because, you know, I think that the hardest part for me personally is just getting everyone on the same page. Indiana talked about this a little bit is sometimes the background of all of the other people that we're working with is not the same background as ours. So before I feel like I can jump into implementing things for MTSS, I need to also first stop and like help explain what MTSS is. 
and explain why problem solving process is important. It's like trying to bridge that gap between our training and background and then the training and background of teachers and principals and other administrators. That's the part that I think makes me feel like it's it's a big mountain that I can't climb, you know? So I have to like, I think relying on each other and trying to, um, you know, sometimes vent and also just problem solve of like, how can we really get this information out there? That's and to that last point real quick. Difficult. I know we have about four minutes left. I just wanted to say quickly too, that um, when we started having these district wide conversations about MTSS, I have insisted that one of the school psychologists be a part of our administrative team that's moving through that piece. Um, and that was, you know, of course, at first it was like, uh, and then I'm like, no, I'm like, none of us have the training in the background that is necessary to be able to help guide these discussions. So that's why um, I've also advocated for that as we move forward too. Oh yeah, this is this was mine too, because I think just to speak like and piggyback off what Rachel was saying, like it, it's exhausting. And I think um, this kind of helps me when I'm exhausted, I'm often like trying to operate in my circle of concern instead of what I can actually influence. And so I really have to remind myself to kind of put put a little bit of blinders on and just try and focus on every day coming to work. What do I have control over? What can I change? What can I do to move things in the right direction with, with our MTSS team? Not necessarily the district level MTSS team, not with, you know, moving forward with evidence-based tier one curricula, like the, I, that's my circle of concern, not what I can control right now. So when I get really exhausted and feel frustrated, I try and bring it back to what I can influence. And sometimes the circle is really small, but we all have a circle. So that's kind of what we wanted to end with is trying to just share that we all have that circle of influence and that there are actionable things that each of us can do however small um so just kind of reflecting and if you want to stamp you can if you just want to reflect on that yourself you can do that too um so so i know everyone's probably ready for a break so um and i know that some of my team may have to bounce out and we'll be here for additional questions. But Eric, I would just ask if there are questions for SCASD that we can answer that maybe we're not in a meet, you know, we're not able to answer after a break or later today, uh, let us know and we'll be glad to get back to you. And we'll make sure that our presentation today, along with the documents, examples of documents are um, accessible by you all through Eric's Padlet. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. We really appreciate your time and listening to our uh, journey here in State College. Thank you. Thank you so much, State College. If you, if everyone wants to take a minute, use your reactions buttons to give them a thumbs up, a clap, uh, another excellent presentation. We hope that this is providing folks with, uh, you know, every journey starts with that first step and some really practical tips from teams who have been through this process. So again, another excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Um, so it is about 10.10. We're right on time here. So we are going, we paused the recording or no, I didn't. Welcome back from break. And we are excited. Our third district presenting this morning is Derry Township School District. So I'm going to turn it over to them. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Kirsten Sherrick. I am the Director of Special Education as, and as you can see from the slide in front of you, we have uh, Dr. David Lillenstein, Dr. Jason Peterson, and Amanda Valentine, our three school psychologists with us as well. Uh, just by way of a little bit of background, this is the third district that I've worked in, and I have worked with uh, many, many school psychologists uh, coming from one of those districts being a very large urban district where we had nine school psychologists. So I've had a breadth of experience, and I can say hands down, um, the team that I have right now is not only one of the most knowledgeable, but uh, professional and skilled and um, smart and just all the all the positive acronyms that you can think of. I have an amazing team and I'm and I'm really lucky. So um, I am going to do what I always do with them, and that is get out of their way. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, <laughs> I confess I was not expecting that. So um, <laughs> anyway, so as, as Kirsten said, Derry Township School District, and I guess and we were kind of uh, laughing in the break as we were chatting a little bit, they were, we we're kind of like the old heads on, on this on this call, um, because our, our role has been non-traditional since about 2004-ish, uh, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, and, and, and we're taking a slightly different tack in terms of the presentation than uh, the wonderful presentations from Indiana and State College. And then we're gonna talk a little bit more about, um, less about the, the, the roles particularly now at this point, but a little bit more about getting there and how we got there. Uh, but the, the one similar sort of structure is that it started with, with RTI back in the early, the early to mid 2000s. That's how it started, which was that, that process and the recognition that education could be something other than reactionary, something other than putting out fires. I think Angela and Indiana had the really great whack-a-mole slide, uh, which was a wonderful way of, of capturing this, that we, as, an, as a district, decided that we wanted to be have a primary prevention focus as opposed to reaction and protection focus. So I know some of the chats people asked about, mentioned things about um, legal protection and evaluations because lawyers have said X, Y, and Z. And my experience is when I've uh, talked to other districts and seen other districts and consulted with folks is that when you spend all of your time <clears throat> sort of trying to test to protect that you end up with more lawsuits as a result and more due processes because it changes the way you practice um, and not necessarily have the focus on the right variables. Um, so for us, it started with RTI. It really started with, and, and, I, and I will give credit to Dave because he was here, he predates me and, and all of this here at Derry Township. And he worked with the administration and was actually, they sought him out because of his knowledge related to response to intervention and how you would start engaging in that process and reading. And as a result, um, <clears throat> he was able to advocate for a much broader role and function. And, and by the way, please feel free to chime in. I'm not planning to dominate the, the conversation here. Um, but it really was able to advocate for that and say, if we engage in primary prevention, that means the school psychologist's role is not just special education. It's all education. It's everybody. School psychologists are not hired to only work in with special education students. We're, we're trained and, and, and are hired to work with all students. And if we can take that focus and that stance as a district, um, <clears throat> from our perspective, then it changes the nature of how you do an education period not just for school sites, but everybody's, it, it changes that focus to say, we need to use everybody's talents and skills and knowledge to maximally meet the student needs. Um, and if we <clears throat> take the time to do that and really emphasize that um, there's more to offer than just testing, and then that can be a, a strong benefit to what we can, what we have um, provided service-wise for our students, then that, that uh, really broadens our role and function. So, we really decided to advocate early on for how do you engage in activities to support the district and the schools? What is the vision? What is the mission? What are we trying to do as a district? Not just what we're trying to do within the context of special education, but what are we trying to do in the district? Um, and, and to their credit, and thankfully, the uh, and, and I think Meg mentioned it earlier about it, uh, getting administrative allies, is the administration recognized that school psychs could do more than just test in place and really had skills to support the problems that we were facing. Um, and, and one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing is, uh, I mean, we jokingly sometimes refer to as reading the tea leaves, which is looking for the patterns in the data, the patterns and the noise of what's coming up, what's happening, what's next, and trying to get ahead of that and trying to be prevention oriented and trying to roll out um, efforts, interventions, instruction, evidence-based practices to address that need. To, to, as an example, when we shut down in 2020, I don't know if you remember this, but there's a pandemic that happened, uh, a, is happening, and we everybody shut down. <clears throat> so the roles of school sites in that time, that, that late spring, as I'm sure everybody else on the call can relate, it sort of shifted a bit in terms of wrapping up you know, evaluations as best you could based on those that had been started, et cetera, at that time and working through that. Well, we also then thought about it and said, wait, we all have to come back to school at some point after being shut down for a couple of months. And obviously at that point, we assumed it would just be uh, you know, a few months and then everything would come back to normal. But we recognized that there was gonna be, a, that we had to do something different to help our students onboard because this was not something that any of us had ever experienced. Now, obviously the administration was spending a lot of time working out the logistics of how to do school uh, and, and all that, which and we spent time 
working on how do we help the students to come back? What do we need to do instructionally to help them come back? And then presented that um, to the administration. So it was really, and I think that's the way we tend to operate is really trying to start from that place of what can we do to support students best? And how do we make sure that we're doing that? Because we recognize that our role is slightly, not slightly, very different from administration and can come at things at a different angle and that that's, that's our, can be our role and function. And so we present the information, we share it with the administration saying, these are things to be thinking about. What do you think about this? this is, is this a good idea? Should we go in this direction? And that takes the burden off of them of always having to be the, the ones that come up with every solution. Every, 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 any problem that comes up, they always have to come up with a solution. So it's, and I think that's something as a district that we do pretty well is we try to share all of these roles and 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 recognize that everybody brings something to the table and we can distribute that responsibility across multiple people to get the best end product. Um, additionally, we, we um, are lucky enough to have uh, a number of interns and the district has been very supportive. Kirsten in particular of that is that we've partnered with universities to make sure that we have and this for the last several years, probably the last six or seven actually, we've had three full-time school psych interns every year. Prior to that, it had been two full-time school psych interns. Uh, and we've been able to do that. And then we also have uh, various and sundry practicum students floating around throughout the year. Um, and they really are able to, to help with that load as well. It gives them a good rich training, but it also then helps to distribute uh, workload and, and, and address that. And, and we did take time several years ago to change uh, when we, when the first evaluation rubric came out, the school psych evaluation rubric came out, we altered and changed it, our job description to match and align with both the, the evaluation rubric as well as the NASP practice model. Uh, and this, the, as you know, the PD CSPG also reflects the practice model. So it was a nice alignment there to say, yes, there, we are in paper and formally recognizing as a district that school psychologists perform roles other than testing and placing. I don't know if anybody want to add anything there. Yeah, Jason, I would add to that. I'm not sure how many of the districts watching um, are actually using the supervision rubric that actually is supposed to be used for school psychologists in Pennsylvania. But that supervision rubric is based on the, the NASP practice model. Um, so, and, and I realize that many in the, in the state can actually be um, rated against that supervision rubric and come out very poorly and that can be very disheartening and concerning, but it also can be used to drive some potential change, to identify some areas of need and uh, some areas of growth. I would think of it as areas of growth as opposed to areas of need. The, um, the job description issue in, in Derry Township, there was a, we had a, a very traditional job description and Jason and I and Amanda, we were talking one day about redoing the job description. And when we were thinking about what it could look like or should look like, we're like, why are we creating something? NASP has already done that with the practice model. So we're not going to reinvent the wheel. We're going to present it a little bit differently because, you know, job descriptions are presented in bullet format. So we took the practice model, converted it to bullet format, and, and we had a job description. Ironically, at the same time, PDE was looking to update their CSPG, which is the state job description for school psychologists. So little fun fact, the CSPG for the Department of Ed, for Pennsylvania Department of Ed for school psychologists, looks an awful lot like Derry Township's job description. There's a reason for that. We knew that they needed a job description. We said, here's a Word document. You can just play with it and add the legalese that you need to it. And PDE did that. And now we have a CSPG in place that is aligned with the NAS practice model, which is also aligned with the, the supervision rubric for school psychologists. And as we're talking about the uh, the practice model, I know this is uh, the uh, the graphics, and I think that uh, both Indiana and State College did a very nice job of describing this. I put the link in as well as the as the, the super groovy new graphic that we have for the practice model over here. Uh, but I, I, I specifically when we when we talked about this, we know we wanted to put in all the domains because look at all the different skill areas and domains of practice. Uh, and, and that's an important part of it. And that is captured in both the evaluation rubric as well as the, uh, the job descriptions, both here at Derry Township at the state level. And that's intentional. I mean, if you, you look at all the different things that we're able to do, and I'm, I would ask, you know, if you throw in the chat, if you tell me you see test and place anywhere, 
uh, if you see that on that on that in, the, in any of those domains, uh, that would be. If you see that, give me a heads up. But we don't. We don't see that. So we really um, try to emphasize these different roles and really spend a lot of time talking to the administration about the fact that we have this training and that we are able to do these different skills and provide support to the, the, the district in a variety of different ways beyond just testing and placing. I know I'll share a personal example that every time we hire a new administration, oh, I should probably say we're a district of 3,600. I don't know if we mentioned that or not. Uh, 3,600 schools, 30, excuse me, 3,600 schools, students. Oh, there are three school psychologists. Um, we have three the interns and, and, uh, and we had cover five buildings. Um, so our ratio works out to actually be about roughly one to 1100 is what actually, so the ratio is not outstanding. It's a little bit different for each of us uh, based on our, our coverages, but it's a little, but that's roughly what it would boil down to. So, but we're still able to have a, a pretty broad role and function in spite of the fact that the ratio is not uh, ideally where we'd like it. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to add folks. So keep you posted on that. Um, hint, hint, Kirsten. Now, um, <clears throat> but anyway, <laughs> so um, yeah, so we, we were able to, to, to cover a lot of these different things and, and we're able to, uh, whenever we've hired a new administrator, and that's where I was going with that, is as a personal example, whenever we've hired a new building principal or assistant principal that I'll be working with, one of the first things that I do is in the summer when they're about to start is I schedule a meeting with them to sit down with them and talk about what the role and function is of a school psychologist in this model, in this broader model. Um, because oftentimes, um, and I think Tim put it in the chat earlier, is that, you know, that's not, a, and we're not narcissistic enough to think that administrative training should focus on the role and function of school psychologists and, and how you can best use them. However, we also know that it doesn't really address that probably much at all, if at all. And so what we wanted to do, what I do and, and advocate that everybody does is sit down with them and explain, look, what is your vision for this building? To share that, I'd be interested in hearing what that is. And, and let's talk about how I can help you actualize that. Because if all I do is test in place, then you really don't get to actualize your vision because it's not gonna happen. There's not enough people to do the heavy lifting for you. So that's something we're able to do. So I sit down with them and talk about what the expanded role and function is of a school psychologist and what it is that I do and what I can do for them that is beyond perhaps what they traditionally conceptualize of a school the role of a school psychologist to be. And I don't know if, if Dave and Amanda, if you want to share examples of, of other things that you have done. Go ahead, Amanda. <laughs> You're unmuted. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I love being prompted to talk by, by these two. Um, <laughs> they're usually our spokespeople for Dairy Township. So I will... Uh, put myself out there a little bit today. You know, one of the things that I'm really passionate about, passionate about in terms of a non-traditional role is being able to put tools in the hands of all teachers that remove barriers for student learning. And one of the things that I've prioritized in between all of the assessment and evaluation that does occur at the elementary building, because I'm assigned to our two to five building, one of the things that I've prioritized is really exploring tools and building collaborative partnerships with people who can help me to identify the strategies and resources that teachers need to be more successful. So through partnerships with, I'll give you an example. Right now I'm working with Tim Kreshman. He's the owner of Action Driven Education. And I was actually attending a special education leadership conference with Kirsten Sherrick about, well, pre-COVID. So going back maybe three or four summers ago at this point. Um, but I met Tim at this conference and he had established a platform called Akamods. And he was doing a presentation of his, his company and the tool that he had created, which really ultimately seeks to put in the hands of teachers resources that increase individualization and differentiation for all learners. So because I was there with Kirsten, who's our director of special ed, I said, you know what, Kirsten, let's, let's take a look at this product. Let's see if we can buy this for our special education teachers for the purposes of making IEPs more individualized and more personally prescriptive. 
And through working with our special ed department and partnering with Mr. Kreshman, we then realized, wait, why are we only giving this tool to our special education teachers? Because simply one purchase opens up the tool for the entire district. So this year, one of the things that, well, it's been several years now, but COVID kind of put the kibosh on things. Um, right as I was doing some rollout work across the district K to 12 um, to roll out this tool to everyone, um, I really kind of circled back around this year and was able to attend all of the grade level meetings and put together a screencast for staff to share this tool and resource for them because I get excited about individualizing for learners, not just learners who are identified for enrichment or acceleration, not simply learners who are eligible for special education supports and services, but for all kids. So putting this tool into teachers' hands really helps them to better learn how to accommodate for learners across a variety of challenge areas. This tool specifically, for example, looks at um, accommodations and modifications across curriculum, instruction, assessment, and environmental classroom and behavior. And um, I was able to share this resource with teachers and now through our MTSS process, when teachers put in a request for classroom assistance, we can use this tool that we've all been provided for the purpose. Um, I kind of look at it like an inspirational springboard for differentiation and, and it's intended to spark conversations. It's intended to spark ideas and it really supports us in moving from problem admiration to problem solving. So one of the things that, you know, when I think about all of these different roles that we have the capability of doing, you know, as school psychs, um, especially for working in a district that has a distributed leadership model, we really have an opportunity to be teacher leaders because we're on the same, we're on the same le level with our colleagues. Um, so how can we use that type of influence and that type of power to be able to build relationships and put these additional tools into the hands of everyone um, for the good of all learners. But what I was going to say is prior, before I went off on that train of thought is, you know, we look at these 10 domains and sometimes they feel really overwhelming. We think about, you know, what could we be doing? What are we not doing? What should we be doing? How can I possibly get to all of these different domains given the extent of the responsibilities I already have? And what I found that works really well for me is thinking about what are some of the things that I'm passionate about? What are those things that I do best? And when I feel like I can't take the next systems level step, I think about what can I do in my personal practice every day to really um, take on one of these domains and think about, um, you know, what can I do here specifically and how will it, how will it in influence the teachers I work with, the students I work with, et cetera. So sometimes I think about, um, you know, not just taking those huge next steps, you know, somebody mentioned in the chat earlier, taking a bite out of the elephant. <laughs> um, you know, this is where we, we really have an opportunity to think about why we're passionate about this field and really selecting and choosing those one or two things that we really want to focus our attention on because that, that invigorates us and excites us to continue to do the work we're doing despite some of the things that we don't love. Um, and I found through this work specifically this year that, you know, we've talked about it time and again today, is the partnership with administration is just so important to making this work work. Um, and, and really, we do that by taking the time to listen to what our administrators need and listening to their mindset and their beliefs and their attitudes and really thinking about how those mindsets, beliefs and attitudes align with our own personal and professional practice and finding those common grounds to be able to take steps to move forward. Um, one of the things someone from Indiana said this morning 
was, um, there are two, I wrote it down and I'm probably going to have this posted on my wall for a while because I just want to think about this over the up and coming weeks. Um, someone said there are two things people hate change and the way things are. And I was like, oh my gosh, my mind could get stuck thinking about that for hours if I were to let it, because it's so, so very true. And it reminded me of a book um, that we referenced very quickly in some of my ed leadership classes. It was called Immunity to Change. And it was by Keegan and Leahy. And the focus is showing how our individual beliefs along with our collective mindsets in the organization combine to create this powerful immunity to change. And then sometimes we get stuck because of fear, anxiety, stress, unknown, lack of control, some of those big things that are, are perceived as barriers. But when we really start to reflect on the attitudes, the habits, the beliefs of ourselves in professional practice and those things that influence our organization, and we really start to think about the mindset required for change, you know, when we look at this question, or when we, when I think about this comment, the two things that we hate are change and remaining the same. So what are those attitudes and mindsets that we can promote and exhibit professionally that will unlock our potential to move forward? Um, so when we think about ourselves as change agents in the role of school psychologists, um, what are our mindsets as, as teacher leaders? Are we doing enough to promote collective efficacy, shared ownership of student outcomes? How do we involve ourselves in discussions? Is it in a way that aligns people or aligns us with teams and teachers or, or do we continue to just be that, that gateway to special education? So I don't know, I could probably just ramble on for the next 45 minutes with all of the thoughts that have been put into my head today based on the things that other people have shared already. I kind of totally went rogue and off of the PowerPoint presentation, but for those of you who know me, I do tend to do that. Um, but I just love the fact that we're here today and we have the opportunity to dialogue with one another and to reflect on our own professional practice because I think this is where change starts for all of us when we actually dedicate and devote this time and attention to what we do. Because as Jason reminds me on a regular basis, what we do is, is um, important work. So I think that's it for my spiel for now. I'll <laughs> chime in guys if I have more later. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. But, but it, I mean, there's a lot there. And, and, and you really, that ability to stop and reflect. And I know somebody put in the chat earlier about how do you change the system when the other system is still up and running? And I know for Dave, because Dave and I were early in this, and, and I probably should preface that we've been doing, as I said, RTI, and as then when the acronym changed, MTSS, since about 2004. So we've been focused and we're, we were one, I think we, I think we might've been the first district approved when they start, when we started before there was an approval process for SLD for our, uh, RTI for SLD determination. So that, that process came after we'd already been engaging in the process for a number of years. So I think we were probably the first district that was uh, approved for SLD uh, using RTI for SLD determination and reading. And uh, we are, and that's K through five. And we're also uh, K through five SLD approved to use RTI for SLD for math determination, uh, our math SLD determination as well. We, uh, we also have PBIS K through eight. We have morning meetings K through eight. Um, what else? So we, we're there, as a district, our stance is to be very data driven and very um, primary prevention focused. And um, that's been a part of this. So we have data team meetings and, and, and Dave and I can reflect back and, and this even predates, you know, a little bit of, a, you know, when Amanda first started years and years and years ago, um, that when the, all the data meetings, yeah, I just made you sound really old, didn't I? Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> I started the same year you started. That's true. Yeah. 2008. <laughs> and uh, we, we facilitated the data team meetings. Um, and that's something we, we did uh, because we were the ones who had the knowledge about the data. How do you, Think about your training as a school psychologist. You're, you know, you're trained, if you just take the, that one as, aspect of that training of the problem solving process and evaluation and using data to make recommendations, you're trained to do that with an individual child often. 
you know, you collect data on an individual child, you do the assessment, you make recommendations, et cetera. We do that same process, but we do that with the system. So we collect the data on the system and then look at the recommendations. So when through that those data team meetings, that's the process we did. We were recommending, making recommendations regarding the core program about intervention choices, about assessment choices. And we were running those meetings, but we, the district had also had taken the time to hire, had the uh, vision and foresight to hire literacy coaches. So then that became a shared responsibility. And then over time, we were able to give over the responsibility of facilitating those meetings to them. So we spend, we are, our role and function within the context of the MTSS system is a little bit different because they're able to manage more of the, the logistical processes of things so we don't have to, whereas we're doing more with, with data things and rates of improvements and, and looking for patterns of, of strengths and weaknesses there. So it's, it's, it's a nice shared um, uh, process there. So I wanna give that context uh, because there might be people saying, well, how can you just pick and choose what you focus on or, or do that? Well, we're not really truly picking and choosing all the time, but we have the ability to do that because the system runs so that every aspect of what we do is designed to get ahead of the problem as opposed to being reactionary, as opposed to only being responding and being back on your heels. So that's how we're able to do that. Um, but I thought I should give that context, which I hadn't right out of the gate. So Kirsten, I think this was you if you want to share a few administrative examples. Yeah, so, um, and Jason, I, I think you phrased it in a, in a really great way to segue to that is, you know, here are people who are, are designed to analyze data, um, solicit data, and then put all that data together and identify patterns and trends. So, you know, when you think about it, it the question is not how can you use a psychologist, is how can you not use a psychologist, a school psychologist? Um, you know, so as Jason mentioned, they're involved in our um, mid-year meetings where we're looking at, you know, teachers who are concerned about students and through programs like Akama that Amanda mentioned and just their involvement in the process, they're able to identify those pre-referral strategies and services that not only are going to collect the data for the individual student, but by virtue of using that strategy, our classroom teachers are just filling their toolbox with, with more tools. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of support for all of our teachers in that way, uh, I think looking at our programs and you know there are, there are tons and tons of, of both uh, core programs for the general education population and of course all the intervention programs and um, you know finding the right program and, and finding the right match for students so that the RTII process is effective. Um, an important component of that is assessing the fidelity of those programs. And so you have that built-in resource available to you. Uh, they can run small groups. They can provide counseling to students um, that direct support to our, our vulnerable population, um, you know, even through, you know, having them do threat assessments and manifestation determinations like those are all things that they're learning more about students and really digging into what is the root of, of what is causing this child uh, you know, to be dysregulated or, or have these needs and put things in place for them. Um, one of the ways that they've been invaluable to me is you know, there, there can be some tough meetings, um, especially you know, with families that don't like the results that you're giving to them. And again, these are people that are trained to navigate um, you know, meetings like this and to have the resources and to have the knowledge to really talk uh, not only knowledgeably, but also in a way that everybody can understand so that we truly can be problem solving what is creating any de divisiveness between you know, a family and, and the district. Um, and lastly, the, the wealth of professional development opportunities. I mean, not only is it around, you know, social emotional topics, um, data, you know, and those things, but as Amanda said, you know, she's, she and, and Jason and Dave, they're always looking at resources, you know, Jason, 
we weren't happy with AimsWeb or maybe C Easy CBM, and you're trying to find something that's out there that makes sense. And so, you know, Jason brought us options that we could consider. So there's a lot of legwork that goes on that administrators don't always have time to do or or know where to start. So those are but a few examples of the ways that school psychologists can support the entire district. Um, there's many, many more. So this is sort of a fun analogy we've been toying around with is we're describing your school psychologist as being like your smartphone, right? Um, you think about your smartphone, it, you, you know, what do you use it for? What do you use your smartphone, your SP for? You know, you go, you have all these apps that are options, all these different skills and, and tools and different things that you use your smartphone for. Um, so like, for example, Dave, do you want to share any examples about different ways, different apps that you use, if you will, skills that you use? And Amanda, same thing. Sure. I um, First off, I, I just want to, um, I think, start off by saying my philosophical foundation um, that I start from is, and and Megan stole my thunder earlier by saying um, I use, I coin, I don't know if I coined the term, but I use the term, be visible, make yourself visible. Um, I'm going to date myself when I share, um, I, I, Cheers was a program that was on TV, I think when I was in college, maybe even in high school, I don't know. But the theme song was, you know, Cheers was a bar where everybody knows your name. And that's how I want to operate as a school psychologist. I want people to know who I am. I want kids to know who I am. Um, and that comes from being visible and being out there. Um, so, you know, easy ways to make that happen, easy ways to, to change, you know, practice. One is um, kids come to school every morning in all of our districts, right? So be visible at that time when they're arriving, be out in the hallway, greeting the kids, um, doing handshakes, high fives, uh, you know, socially distanced even. Um, hanging out at breakfast, greeting the kids, checking in with them. You know, those are some of the easy ways that we started to, to kind of make ourselves more visible. Um, and, and again, I, I want the students to know me by name. And, and when I'm, I'm just operating as an evaluator or someone who meets with kids for eligibility evaluations, they're not going to know my name after that day or, or after that year. I want kids to know my name year after year after year. Then I know I've had an impact um, on the students. Um, you know, here, I, one of my assignments is the high school. And um, at the high school, I am largely involved with mental health. Um, I'm written into IEPs. Um, psych services is a, is a service that can be written into an IEP. So I meet with students on a regular basis. Um, a bill for access. So, um, you know, if a student is access eligible, then <clears throat> we do submit for reimbursement for access funds. Um, it's a way of, of, you know, getting back some of the money that you're spending to, to help students, and, and then you can help more students with, that, with those funds. Um, what do I do during that time? It's largely coping skills, working on the students' coping skills, frustration tolerance, um, strategies for anxiety. That's a huge one, but, um, you know, I, again, meeting with the students on a regular basis, when they do have a crisis, they have someone they can go to, they have a name, they have a person and a face that they, they are comfortable with. Kirsten mentioned earlier about threat assessments. <clears throat> I see threat assessments, we've done a lot this year, but I see a threat assessment as an opportunity. Um, you know, uh, many of the threat assessments have been with students who have IEPs that I might know from, you know, working with them over the years or being on their IEP teams over the years. But many of the kids, if not most of the kids, are students without IEPs. And it's an opportunity to work with all ed, not just with special ed, but with all ed. And I think that's a real difference here in this district is that we work with all ed. A um, lot of consultation with teachers, consultation with our behavior coach here at the high school. At, at each level, we have a behavior coach. Um, and uh, I work with the behavior coach here at the high school daily. Um, there's a wall between our offices, so we see each other every single day and we're always talking to students. Um, student assistance. <clears throat> I sit on the student assistance team. We all sit on the student assistance team and we take cases and, and, uh, and we work with students that way. Outside my office here at the high school, I have a QR code. Um, actually, I think we have a QR code outside all of our offices. I receive referrals from students. They come by and, and you know, students are aware of safe to say and, and tools like that that we have in all of our districts. But we have a QR code. Um, kids can click on that. 
It brings up our email. I get email requests from students all the time to see them. Um, sometimes the sometimes the email in the subject line just says, I need your help. And there's nothing more than that. I kind of drop everything to, to find that student and to, to see what's going on. Um, and then finally, I would talk about, I, I also work with our emotional support um, program. We, you know, together with the teachers using um, their skills and, and, and my skills and their training and my training collectively together to make a better program. We worked on a curriculum scope and sequence looking at social skills development. Um, we, we came up with a, a, a four stage um, uh, presentation of social skills development in the district that, that uh, the teachers can look at for growth. And uh, we went out, we researched other emotional support programs. We took a look at some curriculum that we could, or curricula that we could use. And we ended up um, uh, settling on a, on a curricula that we use. We use strong kids K to 12. Um, with our, our, our uh, special ed emotional support program. So that's just a slice of, of some of the things that, that we do. Um, and Jason's gonna talk a little bit later about why we can, or how we can do all of that. Um, so I'll turn it back over to Jason. Man, anything you wanna add? No, I think you guys got it covered, but I will, you know what I thought I had while people were talking about duty coverage, um, you know, when I got assigned bus duty last year, three times a day, because we had students coming and going half day and half day, my initial attitude and response to that was, ugh, I do not have time to do this. I do not want to do this. I have better things to be doing with my time. But you know what? It's actually one of the things I grew to love and look forward to every single day because I was out of my office interfacing with students, was able to develop simple, funny ways to interact with a handful of kids. So every day they would be coming into the building and, um, you know, they would look for me. And if I wasn't there, they would notice I wasn't there. Where were you at? What happened? Um, and it was just a really cool way to be able to connect with kids and also to be reminded of what neurotypical looks like. Because sometimes in this role, you know, we work with a lot of students who have concerns. And sometimes I sort of feel like I lose vision and perspective for what a typically developing student looks like. So there were some really some positive benefits to that, both for me personally, because it was uplifting and elevating to my mood, but also for me to connect professionally in a different way with teachers and students. Awesome. Thanks, Amanda. And then there, there are a lot of things. And I, and I actually was reflecting on the, the quote that you uh, borrowed from uh, Indiana about the, you know, you don't like, you don't like change and you also don't like the way that things are. One of the other roles that we engaged in is a couple of pre-COVID as we at the, at our middle school started the conversation and I work at our middle school in our K-1 building, started the conversation about how would do we do in-school suspension? Because everybody was complaining about in-school suspension. It didn't work and everybody, everybody just kept getting suspended and nobody, nothing ever changed, nothing ever changed. So we sat down with the SEO, I sat down with the SEO coach and the building administrator, and we had a conversation about that and said, well, well, then let's stop just having kids going into a small room with cinder block walls and, stay, and trying to get them to do work or wake them up when they're nodding off for a day and thinking that's going to change behavior. Why don't we just totally change what we're doing? It can't, frankly, it can't be any worse than what's happening now, right? So we totally shifted how we do suspension at the middle school, um, which is it's now instructional. The kids are assigned on certain days when they are when they are SEL days, cell days is what we call them. And they come down and they work on getting taught the skills that they need to remediate why they got suspended in the first place. They have a chance to make amends and give back to the, the district and the building. They do work on a little bit of catching up on any academic work that they're behind on, things like that. Um, we do some, it's, it's a little counseling there. So we assign the school counselors are assigned as well to be a part of that. And then we talk about re-entry plans and what you're going to do when you go back into the classroom to change, to make a meaningful and lasting change. And it's kind of funny because I was thinking, Andrew, when you put that up there is that, yeah, people were really ticked off with how things were because they felt suspension wasn't working. And then we tried to, we implemented this new model and then people were like, no, no, change isn't good. You shouldn't do that. The, the kids aren't scared to be suspended. That's not a good thing. They should be scared to be suspended. And it's like, well, no, it's, it's actually affecting behavior change. Yes, they're not dreading coming to do this work because we actually engage with them. And what we learned through that work, and this is something we did collectively, was 
that we have students, the students who typically get suspended a lot, don't feel a sense of belonging to the school. They don't feel like this is this pl their place. They don't feel connected to the building, to the teachers, to the administration, to the peers. So we would not have gotten that information. And then we started saying, wait, if this is what they're anecdotally telling us, let's start gathering a little more information to find out. And that's what we found out, is they just don't feel those students feel marginalized. They don't feel like they belong. So we gave us an opportunity to change and think about how we're approaching all students. Because um, actually, it's interesting. They mentioned, uh, I think, State College is using the BESS and SRSS by Indiana for the universal screeners. We've gone, we've actually ab abandoned what we had typically used for universal screening, which was the SSIS, and are rethinking that and actually potentially looking at maybe using a belongingness scale and having the students self rate and say that's a more indicative um, screening tool because it captures both uh, whether you're externalizing or internalizing, but really gets it what might be the core problem. So that's kind of our latest and greatest thinking on that is that maybe the direction we want to go in terms of collecting that information. So there are lots of different um, options that we're able to, and, and activities we're able to engage in because we're doing this data, we're collecting this data. And, and frankly, you know, un unlike Indiana and State College, we don't have a university in the backyard. We don't have anybody close by. So we don't have that as an option. We've never had that as, as an option. Um, they're, I'm, I'm, they're lucky, great for them, and that's wonderful. We haven't had that. So we've been have, had to do this on, um, based on the resources we have. Now, do we, we do partner with universities for when we start doing some program evaluation to help with the data analysis, but the running because they have better statistical software than we do. Um, so we get them engaged with that part, but um, we're, we're largely doing this just, just us um, and using them in those very targeted ways. So I ask you again, so if you think about it, what do you use your, your, your smartphone for, your SP for? Do you use it? Hopefully this works. Do you use your smartphone only to make phone calls? Of course not, right? Who does that? So why would you use your school psychologist only to do evaluations? So if you think about the power of this device that you have everywhere and what it can do, and yes, ostensibly it is a telephone. You can use it to make phone calls, but you use it for about a thousand other things. Similarly, that's why I would encourage everybody to conceptualize their school psychologist and how they're using them. Are you using your school psychologist in all the uh, skills that they have in order to do that. So the, I just thought it worked out nicely that a uh, little parallel there that your smartphone and school psych are both have the same initials. Um, but it's, it's really a, a great analogy is that if you use only, if you use the tool for only one thing, you're wasting all of that time and money and resources. You know, you, 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 pay, us, you pay us, so why not use the full range of skills that we're able to provide? Um, and so I would argue that that's the best way to think about that, not only to use it for evaluations, but all these other activities that we engage in. So for example, here, you're in, this is just a small sampling um, that I actually pulled from, our, uh, from the job description um, in terms of the apps, if you will, they're able to do. So yeah, we can spend time improving academic achievement, promoting positive behavior, creating safe, positive school climates, coordinating professional development, we're, um, we're training all of our staff on social emotional learning on their own. And that's been something that we've been a part of as school, school psychs in terms of creating that training for the staff um, and providing that training for the staff. This is actually doing the, the professional development with others, our SEL coaches and, and a few other folks have been the ones who've been in providing that training. So that's something we're able to do. We, we're taking advantage of all those skill sets that we have. So there's just a, 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 a a, a short list of the things that we're able to do um, within the context of the district, the, the apps that we're able to provide. So anything anybody would like to add? I'm sorry, I kind of get rolling, like Amanda said. <laughs> keep rolling. Okay, keep rolling. So, and, and we do frame it. We do frame this a lot as how do you actualize the district's vision? Where do you want to go? So what we do is like, as, as Kirsten said, when you're looking at assessments, you know, administrators, we don't expect them to have deep understanding of reliability and validity and the tech psychometric properties of assessments. Um, they just say, hey, I need an assessment that does X. I need assessment that does Y. We want to measure this. This is what we're looking to do. So then they say, okay, great. Well, that's, that's where we can step in. It was, we're able to um, 
be the ones to actually dig and find out the information and check this, the psychometrics on an assessment and say, yeah, this would be a good use of time and money for us to engage in because it really moves the needle for us from an assessment perspective um, that you otherwise wouldn't have. So that way you don't waste money. And that's something that as education we typically done is people will find something they think looks nice and they'll go out and get it. And then they start using it and then get frustrated because it's not working. Well, it might not have worked for a reason. Um, and I'll give a, a great example from several years back. And, and I, if you use these assessments, I would say, I'm, I was almost said I'll apologize for criticizing them, but I'm not going to because uh, here's your chance to, to change direction. If you use the, the DOMA or the DOR, the Diagnostic Online Reading Assessment or the Diagnostic Online Math Assessment from Curriculum Associates, stop. Um, just that's your friendly tip. Uh, because when they approached us about it, because somebody had seen it at a conference, we went and started to look to see what the psychometrics were for that. And it was normed on a population of about 120 uh, college students from Berkeley, California. And yet is marketed as a K-12 assessment tool, online assessment tool for reading and math for, for children in the public schools, K-12. Not a representative sample at all. The reliability and ability were terrible. And they tried to sell it to us. And they said, what can we do differently to get you to buy this product? And I was meeting with the sales associate. And I said, you need to change how your tool was developed. Um, if it works, then you figure out that it does work, but just trying to sell it to us is we're not buying it. So he took all of his pens that he was leaving for me and his binder that he was going to leave for me and the notepad and the, the, the portfolio he was going to give. And he took them all away and, and left and stormed out of my office. I'm okay with that um, because it, it just didn't work. And that's something that that's something we can provide. So you don't, we don't have time and money to waste in schools. So that's a service that we can provide. Similarly with interventions vetting interventions to make sure that they actually are some things that are going to work, that there's a high likelihood that they're going to be successful, the students for the students you're trying to work with. And if you don't have the ability to resource or maybe to find them online, and I know that Erica shared in the chat earlier, a number of different websites that it will help you in terms of um, narrowing your search there. Um, if you start engaging, that's great. And those are, we can help you understand what those mean and whether they're effective or not. But beyond that, if you're engaging in the current practice, we can do program evaluations to determine, is it actually working? Is it maybe something that somebody, you've homemade something that you seem, seems like, seems like it'd be very effective. Well, is it? Let's do the program evaluation to determine that or not. And if it's not, you can't be afraid of the data to say, nope, it's not working. Um, we, we spend a lot of time analyzing the universal screening data. We've made recommendations. We've changed our core program. We're currently using open court. When, when I started here, and Amanda and I started here back in 2008, it was just sort of a, it was like the wild, wild west, is people kind of said, this is generally what we're going to do for a reading um, instruction and trust that you know how to do that. And uh, so we started analyzing the, the universal screening data and realized we had big gaps in skill areas. So we made a recommend, we started the, started the call for doing a, a process of evaluating core programs to change what we're doing and had a, got a couple of our literacy coaches letters trained and then provided training for the staff on how you actually teach reading and then started the new core program. So we developed a skill set for the teachers, recognized the problem, and then created the, um, the, the circumstances that allowed that to do. And it's funny because I, I, I'm gonna say something really quick because it just popped into my head is that my daughter often uh, would ask what it is that a school psychologist does other than go to boring meetings because that was her lens in terms of what, what I did for most of the day. And I said, the way I described it to her was very simple and I said, our job is simply to set up the circumstances to ensure that teachers can do their best teaching and kids can do their best learning. That's what we do. We manipulate all those variables to make that happen. And these are some of the things we're able to do. Analyzing office discipline referrals. You know, several years ago, we started looking at that to determine are we disproportionate in our, our, um, our discipline referral and our, our, our behavior practices. Spoiler alert, like everybody else, we are. Um, but we didn't have that conversation. We looked at our special ed referrals for the same thing. Are we disproportionately referring students of color, uh, students of poverty? You know, are, are there, are there um, intersectionality that's going on there? We started having that conversation six years ago about what it looks like and what we can start to do differently. Um, we actually, we've even created a course for our middle school to teach social emotional learning skills um, and got it approved by the curriculum council. Um, so we do a lot of these different skills and tasks, and it's really because we're constantly looking at all the data that comes up and even your existing data streams to determine what are the needs that are presenting? What do we need to be doing differently? And our administration has allowed us to do that because um, they recognize the benefit of it. 
uh, because it's helping them to, to move the needle on their goals and what they want to do. So as I jokingly say, and I saved this for the, the last part of the slide because I'm a colossal geek, is we're the Spocks to your Captain Kurtz as administrators. You know, you guys lead the way and you run the ship however you want. And when you need, when you need tools and someone to do the research for you, that's what we're here to do. That's what we can do for you. We were able to provide those different services for you. So, and you may be wondering, how is it we're able to do this? So we put this in intentionally um, because it is important, I think, to talk about is our, on average for all of us, are we probably do about 20 to 25 evaluations per year. Some years a little higher, it's rarely that it's lower, <laughs> but some years it's a little higher than that, but that's in general where we, where we fall in terms of the number of evaluations that we're conducting. And that's because the administration has recognized that if we broaden the role and function, so it's not simply focused on evaluation, 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 but what are you doing proactively and preventatively, we head off a lot of these concerns before they become people who would be referred to evaluation. Our only response and only tool is not simply about special education evaluation. As school psychologists, we have a lot more tools in our arsenal and we're able to do that. And as a result, it, it, the, the net effect is it reduces the number of evaluations per year. Um, and generally we're the ones requesting these evaluations. We don't get a lot of parent requests. We don't get a lot of parent requests because we spend a lot of time interfacing with our parents and our teachers and our staff in being visible, not just being the stop at the end of the line, but being at the beginning of the line to say, look, let's talk about what we can do differently. There's lots of things we can do to support your, your student and, and your child. So um, that's how that rolls. Um, I also put in here and it's, you know, because we're SL, uh, RTI approved for SLD determination, we don't do a lot of IQ testing. So we're not losing a lot of assessment time doing that and, and spending it on an, an assessment that isn't always informing what you're gonna do anyway. We usually, don't, not usually, we basically conduct IQ testing only for those IQ dependent identifications. Is a child a student with an intellectual disability? Are they gifted? Because the, all the processes that we've developed and designed and been able to do, we don't, um, that's not a relevant variable um, because we're able to know what the students' needs are and how to engage in that practice. So it is focused on being primary prevention. It's focused on how do we get out and work with the students to meet their needs. Um, we, Dave mentioned we're on student assistance programs, our student assistance teams, and we are. But it's funny because uh, there, we don't get tons and tons of referrals to our student assistance programs. And that's because we spend so much time front loading all of our work um, to make sure that we're meeting kids' needs that that really is a very small portion of the population, the very needy portion. Um, they're the ones who really need that level of support, but it's not as many because we're able to, to uh, meet everybody else's needs. Um, so all that primary prevention through MTSS and PBIS and the consultation work really uh, largely reduces the number of evaluations that we have to do and increases the amount of flexibility we have in terms of providing services. I feel like I'm talking a lot. Dave, Amanda, Kirsten, please. <laughs> yeah, I just want to add, you know, Jason, one of the one of the things that I've heard when you start talking about this is if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so it's really important to add tools to your toolbox um, so that not everything looks like a nail and, and you have an awful lot more to offer. Um, I'm sure there were some eyebrows raised when you saw the number of evaluations that we do a year. Um, that, that's true. Um, reevaluations, do we do reevaluations? Yes, but we are, we are largely consultants on a team deciding what to do and what's necessary as part of reevaluation. We put a structure into place a few years ago, which at first I was like, oh gosh, now we have more meetings, but actually I love it. Uh, we call them 60 day meetings and we meet several times a year. I think it's quarterly um, where we review 60 days roughly prior to students coming up for reevaluation to kind of take a look at their, with the, the, the case manager and also any other related service providers to take a look at the student's file to, to see um, you know, can we make a decision regarding their eligibility and need for special education based on the data that we already have? We're a data rich district. We have a ton of data. Why do we need to gather new data? Most of the time we don't. And so we're using the reevaluation process to memorialize the data that we're review, reviewing in the report. Um, and, and that has eliminated a lot of um, time that uh, we consider to be redundancy evaluations. You know, we, we, don't, we don't do that anymore. Um, and that has freed us up for a lot of these other services that we've talked about. 
Yeah, and, it, and it's not, it's, and it, this didn't happen overnight. Uh, and this is not like, you know, that we live in, you know, there's some sort of miracle cure here. This was intentional. I mean, you know, we, we intentionally changed the way we were doing things. We intentionally said, and, and, and during that transitional time, it, it was challenging because the workload was higher because you were still functioning under that sort of old model as you were transitioning to the new one. Um, but it is, it is completely doable. And when you get to the other side, it's definitely worth it because you're, you're able to spend your time and energy more effectively. Um, and that's what we found. So every, every problem that you present, I think Dave, you mentioned it earlier about things being an opportunity. COVID's an opportunity. I mean, if you're not engaging in more practices that involve mental health and behavior support for students, then you, you're missing the boat. Um, because if the COVID did nothing else, is it turned over the rock that already existed that showed how many issues there really were for students, uh, for children and adolescents that need to be addressed. And so this is a, a great opportunity to leverage that to change your role and function. Yeah, you say we have all these issues. We have mental health is on the rise for children and adolescents and their concerns are coming up and suicide, uh, suicidality is coming up and there are more, lots more students with suicide ideations, et cetera. Yeah, we can address that or I can, I can spend the rest of my time testing. Where do you wanna spend the energy? Um, and so for us, it was a matter of shifting that, that emphasis and that focus with, uh, with the administration being on board with it. And it is, it's a very dynamic, we meet weekly with Kirsten um, and the assistant director of special education. We have meet, weekly meetings with them. Uh, we meet week, I, every two weeks with, uh, we have student support meetings. So we meet every two weeks with our, the building administrators to which we're assigned to address concerns. And it's a multidisciplinary team. Uh, folks getting together to, to meet to discuss what are the concerns, what's going on, what's coming up. And, in, as, and as we go through those meetings, you start to hear patterns start to come out. And every, as I said, every problem is an opportunity. So when you hear those patterns start to come up, you say, well, okay, why are these things coming up? Rather than just react to these problems, we need to address and be reactive to those problems in this moment. But then we also need to figure out what upstream is causing that. Where is that coming from? How do we get ahead of this so we can reduce those issues from being present? Um, and that's, that's how we spend a lot of our time. And it was moving and shifting that role and function and people's understanding of what it is we can do by being generally useful. I know you've heard it a couple of times here today. Uh, thank you, Robert Bernreiter, because to, to give you an idea where that came from, there's a lecture that's endowed. He's, Robert Bernreiter was the director of school psych program at Penn State uh, for a number of years. And he um, came back to, the, and to speak at the lecture that was endowed in his name when he was in like his early 90s. And they asked him, they, well, he was up there and he's speaking. They said, I know what the secret to the future of school psychology is. And everybody sort of leaned in to hear what this was. And he said, be generally useful. And that's something we beat into the heads of all of our interns <laughs> every year, which is that's the, that's the secret to it, is it be generally useful. So if somebody's having trouble covering duty, yeah, I'll cover your bus duty. Um, to give you an idea, in about two hours, one of the things we're doing is we collectively decided to support our teachers because what they need is time is the school counselor and I at the RK1 building, we're, we're picking up their students from recess and lunch. So that way they don't have to. So they get that extra maybe five to 10 minutes of just like, because that's what people need right now. So it's just, that's not part of the job description. It's just something we're doing that we're doing that collectively K through five is everybody's doing that over the next several weeks is just helping out by just saying, you know what, we're gonna give you a little bit of a break, just a couple of minutes. We're going to be generally useful to you. So transitioning slightly as we're talking about all this stuff, um, we, uh, you know, uh, this is our chance to brag ever so slightly, which is makes all of us extraordinarily uncomfortable. So we do it quickly is um, a couple of years ago, we were recognized, applied for and were recognized by NASP as being proficient. There are four levels. There is the no recognition, emerging, promising, proficient, exemplary. There's only one district in the nation that's been recognized as having exemplary school psych services, and that's Alexandria, Virginia. So well done them. Give them kudos. Um, we were recognized as being proficient. And so it really, what, and the reason I bring it up is that if you're thinking about what your current model looks like and how you'd like to change things, I highly recommend um, going through the process, even if you don't end up applying in, the, in a given year, is to download the, the rubric and to get access to that and really gives you a chance to reflect in, on, on your current practices and what you're doing and what you could be doing um, and how you could be changing that. I know there was definitely, after we went through the process, we're like, oh yeah, you know what? We need to change this. We need to do this differently. We need to fix that. Um, it's really great. We're always learning and looking for that. So it was a great opportunity for us to do that. 
Um, and so I highly recommend if you haven't getting a chance to do that, it gives you a really great opportunity to reflect on your own practice. And I think that's time, right? I'm not sure, Erica, should we get the hook? Um, so this is us. Um, you absolutely feel free to email any of us. We'd be happy to talk more about this and how you move through the change process. Um, and it really is a lot of, you know, the nice thing is if your administration is on board, it's a lot easier to advocate for that. I worked in another, another district where it was sort of grassroots where we had to, we advocated up to the administration. They were like, okay, maybe, um, but we were able to work on that, that change process with them. So that's us in a nutshell. Anything anybody else would like to add? No, thank you, Jason. Yeah, the only thing I would add is, um, you know, if you want to start, start small. Um, assemble a coalition of the willing. Um, I did not coin that term either. Um, that was, I think, in the early 2000s when we invaded Iraq. A coalition of the willing. Start small. If you're in multiple buildings, don't worry about having a, the change happen in every building. You know, listening to Indiana talk, I'm envious that they were able to make such significant change in three years because it didn't take three years here. Um, we're, we're still trying to make, you know, impact and, and to maintain it and have it, you know, be a cultural change. But yeah, start small and assemble your coalition of the willing and um, celebrate your successes, even if it's only this much, it, it will grow from that. So thank you so much, Dairy Township team. Thank you so much. Indiana area team, thank you so much, State College team.